Welcome, friends. It's the Movie Boom Podcast. Movie Boom Podcast. Enjoy the show. Zachy and Brian are talking about movie boom. Movie Boom Podcast on the radio. My name is Gladiator. Father to a murdered son, husband to a murdered wife, and I will have my vengeance. At my signal, unleash hell. Am I not merciful? What we do in life echoes in eternity. Welcome to a movie film commentary track. My name is Zachy Hassan. I'm here with Brian Hall. Hey, how's it going, Zachy? Brian? Yes? Am I not merciful? <laughs> I'm having us watch the theatrical cut as opposed to the extended cut. Which I did not know existed till this week. Oh, really? <laughs> no, no. And you know what's funny? I don't know how I would have seen it, but there was a scene I was waiting for where uh, Joaquin Phoenix, like, uses a sword against a bust and uh it didn't happen and i thought what the heck and then i was reading about the deleted scenes and i saw that was a deleted scene so yeah. i don't know maybe the last time i watched it that was the version that may have been may have been what you watch well we are of course talking about gladiator we buried the lead yes yes as one may bury little statuette figures of their family <laughs> in the coliseum <laughs> that's right <laughs> um yeah you know it, this is a movie that that uh obviously we we've seen at least a few times since it came out i'm assuming yeah yeah this you know this is one that i have not seen as many times as you might think this might be my third or fourth time seeing it i think i'm with you yeah i haven't seen it a ton but yeah i've seen it enough yeah yeah well as beloved as it is i feel like oh i i maybe i don't i haven't seen it as many times as others have but i was shocked how much I remembered the score, so many quotes, so many yeah. moments. I mean, it's a movie that really sticks with you. It it absolutely does. And clearly it has stuck with the public to some extent because there is a sequel coming out 24 years after the fact. Yep. Yeah. Which is, you know, it, it's, it feels more common lately, but it's not as common as one would think. And to especially have the same director return. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So we thought, hey, you know what? Now is as good a time as any to, to hop in the old Wayback Machine and, and visit those bygone days of strength and honor. <laughs> so it's a different time. So we are we are watching Gladiator. If you want to watch along with us, feel free to, to go ahead and pull up your copy. As alluded to earlier, we're watching the slightly shorter theatrical cut because, well, let's face it, we all got things to do. <laughs> so uh, I'm queued up and ready. How about you, Brian? I'm ready. All right, so we're going to do the thing. I'm going to say one, two, three, play, and then we will go. Uh, Here we go. One, two, three, play. You know, to really uh, cement this movie in time, in the era that it was released, I was reading that Gladiator was the first double-disc DVD to be released by DreamWorks. That sounds right. And it was like, wow. Wow. Yeah, <laughs> you know, like when DVD was this, uh, I remember when DVD was slowly being introduced at Blockbuster. Right. You know, like I, I wasn't a, a Laserdisc household. I can see now as an adult, I probably would have been. But DVD player, when I finally had my first job and some some money, you know, and being the cinephile that I was, you can bet that I, I bought a DVD player as expensive as it was at the time. And then it was exciting to see these movies come out and they would be in such high quality and they'd be letterboxed and there'd be all the, the bonus features. I remember watching the bonus features on this DVD. Oh yeah, absolutely. Oh, and the menus, the menus, how can you the forget menus. the menus? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it's just, it's amazing to think that this was at the beginning of, of that era. That was a big era. I mean, that was maybe one of the most profitable eras for movies, right? Where they could make so much extra money in the home video market with those DVDs, which they are not getting now. D- DVD is a, a dead format now, unfortunately, but, but yeah, certainly there was a time there where it was, it was a, a, a vein of, of, of income for the studios that they had n- not even anticipated. Yep. Yep. And then, you know, in college, like I was the, we've talked about this. I was the type of kid in high school or junior high or whatever, using my allowance to buy a VHS 
you know, copy of the fugitive, right? <laughs> that was, that made me unique. <laughs> and, uh, and then you go to college and it was amazing. Everybody had a DVD collection. Yeah. You know? Yep. Usually including lost in space and fools rush in <laughs> and analyze this and analyze yep. this. Exactly. Yep. yep. Uh, which um, for those listening, usually if you got a DVD player, you got like free movies included with it. And there was like a grab bag of those titles usually. Yeah. Limited to those titles. Now this shot right here, uh, our introduction to Maximus, I kind of love Russell Crowe told the story about how he got on set. It's like his first day of shooting and Ridley Scott tells him, okay, here's what we're going to do. You're going to, you're going to look to slightly to this side. You're going to look as if you see a bird and you're going to look like the bird is flying above you and you'll be kind of momentarily carried away. And then you're going to glance over at the battlefield and, and then you'll be, you'll be pulled back to the battle. And he's like, okay, okay, fine. And they call action and he does exactly what we just watched. And Ridley Scott comes over and says, we're going to get along just fine. <laughs> oh, that's I like that. <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> and indeed they have. They've worked together many times since then, right? Yeah. Wow. Good point. <laughs> that's a very funny story. I love that. Um, and it is actually just as an intro to the character. What a great intro to our lead. I, that, it says that everything shot, that needs to be said. Everything. Exactly. It tells you everything you need to know about him. Yep. 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 Um, I mean, obviously, or maybe not obviously for me, this was my big introduction to Russell Crowe. I don't mm -hmm. think I'd seen the insider first. Okay. Um, and I hadn't seen the quick and the dead and yeah, for many people, this was their, their, their egress into, into the, the, the icon that is Russell Crowe. I think we can call him an icon at this point, right? I think so. I think, um, so. I, I was already a fan of his because, uh, I had, seen, well, first time I ever saw him was in, uh, virtuosity, which um, I was familiar with, but still to this day have not seen. Yeah. So I watched that and I knew him by name from that and I didn't like the oh. movie and it didn't do much of anything, but then I saw him in LA confidential and he just knocked my socks off. And that remains to this day, one of my very favorite movies. Yeah. 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 So, so I already knew him and then I'd seen the insider. So I was, I was, it definitely felt like this was sort of the coming out party for Russell Crowe for, for many people, but I was, I was already like on, on board the train, you know? Yeah. That all makes sense. And then of course he went on to win an Oscar for, that's uh, right yeah for this so some say belatedly winning the oscar here uh for the one he should have won for the insider the year prior right right uh, which is a terrific performance in in the insider yes oh amazing i'd like to watch that again well this is pretty harrowing <laughs> yeah generally you don't want to ride out of the woods without your head i think you yep. need it yep uh their man trying to see if they can settle things and when uh, he returns headless what does his number one say here? They say no. Yeah. <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> That's right. Um, yeah. Good Lord. So glad I was born <laughs> when I was born. <laughs> um, this, by the way, I thought was really fascinating. So this woods was set to be deforested. And oh, so uh, the movie reached out to whoever was going to do that and was like, hey, do you mind if we burn it down? <laughs> and uh, the, the people were like, go ahead. And then I was wondering, because you're seeing all these flaming fireballs hurtling through the air, blasting across treescapes. Yeah. And I thought, wow, how do you how do you do that? You know, and uh, turns out you find a force that's ready to be torn down. See, it's just that easy. <laughs> Don't you love that, though? I love hearing stories like that where uh, I, I'm not sure which movie I'm thinking of, but there was one where they wanted to destroy a train or a bridge. And they're like, oh, yeah, we found this bridge in some country that had nothing to do with where we were shooting, but it was going to be torn down. And we we're like, all right, we'll fly over there for a day, blow up the bridge, get that production value. <laughs> Lethal weapon three. They were going to blow up that building in the cold open. Perfect. Right. Yeah. Love it. Um, you know, it, it, something else that hit me. I mean, I'll just say right off the bat, uh, you know, there's a lot of, visual effects in this film, especially with like the Coliseum and whatnot. But there is so much location shooting here and, you know, actual extras and, and costumes and props. And you just, the whole way through with this film, I really, really think you feel the value of that, right? This movie feels very lived in. Yeah. Um, just so much, you know, backgrounds that are not filled in. There are actual, you know, dust particles floating through the air. 
um, I, I was just really, I've just gotten so used to the way that films look now that going back and watching this from the year 2000, I, I mean, I was immersed in a way that I feel like I haven't been in a while and I just really loved it. It is weird to, to be like this old movie from the year 2000. Isn't that a weird <laughs> I know almost a quarter of a century, right? Yeah. <laughs> What we do in life echoes in eternity, Brian. Yep. I, t- I tell you that all the time. So many amazing quotes from this movie. And it's amazing how much uh, the script was getting bashed while they were filming, right? I mean, <laughs> Russell Crowe himself, I think, you know, told the writer that certain lines were garbage. And there are lines that are beloved this, to this day. Well, I think what he said is your lines are garbage, but I'm the greatest actor ever and I can make them work. Yeah, right. And then he threw a phone at him just for for measure. Just he to, cr- he 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 crowed him. <laughs> he crowed. Him. <laughs> he pulled a crow. <laughs> it does feel like the, remember that quaint era when you had every other day stories about Russell Crowe's temper. Yeah, yeah, that's the thing too. Because he's, I'd say he's beloved by me. Like when I see him, he's a welcome presence. Yeah, but then I f- forget that there was sort of an era, sort of a bad boy era with him. Yeah, now he's kind of rotund with his big beard. He looks like John Hammond, you know? <laughs> wow, you're right. <laughs> I wouldn't have thought of that comparison, but you're totally right. <laughs> Look at all this stuff. Look at these flames. and You, 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 you got to so... do it for reals. You got you to gotta impale those people for reals. You got <laughs> you to gotta immolate those people for reals. <laughs> it's just so tactile. Uh, yeah, you yeah. know, you really feel it for that for that reason. For those of you who've got your movie film bingo card out, uh, go ahead and mark tactile. <laughs> it's really scrappy dappy do. <laughs> Anybody? No. <laughs> man, I can hear the music. Oh man, this score. This is another one where I don't feel like I listened to Braveheart endlessly. Okay. And I don't know that I listened to this one as much, but I could. Oh man, I listened to the crap music. out of this one. Yeah, I knew it. Almost all of it. I, I yeah. it just it's been in the culture. I think. Did you use this in one of your short films? No, I used Backdraft. Okay, well, Hans which is it. which is adjacent to this because I'm pretty sure Zimmer used some of the same same beats. Absolutely, and some of this did remind me a little bit of Pirates of the Caribbean. Uh, that too. Yeah. Um, this was definitely that that era. Yeah, the the big heroic like Maximus charging music. That's 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 a few doors down from Pirates of the Caribbean. Yeah, yeah. Um, now sometimes when I watch things like this, I get a little overwhelmed just thinking about the execution of it. Like watching right. all these other people slam into other people, and they all have armor on, and they have weaponry, and there's flames in the background, and I just and you look at all the different shots, and I think. Oh, like I almost go cross-eyed thinking about how to to pull this off. And then I read that it took uh, 20 days to film this. And you go, oh, well, there you go. That that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. I mean, this is and just this, I mean, this sequence is so essential, right? Because it sets the, the visual template for the film and sort of the approach to violence. But also, more importantly, from a story perspective, it gives us a sense of Maximus both as a person uh, and as a strategist. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Right. So, so he, he, he has the strength to, to, you know, he can, he can defend himself as, as we see right here, but you know, the, the fact that he has the, the loyalty of his men and his, you know, his connection to the earth, you know, which they reinforce again and again, he's a salt of the earth type. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I love that little you know, affectation they give him where he just, wherever he is, he sort of picks or be, before something's about to begin, he picks yeah. up a little bit of the earth and rubs his hands with it. Oh man. Just, yeah. Like the snow falling and just incredible. And you get this sort of, uh, modulated shutter work here, right? That's where right. It looks a little uh, like stuttery, mm-hmm. which yeah. I, to my mind, the first time I remember seeing that was saving private Ryan. Yeah, me too. Um, which is funny. Cause in my mind, I thought I remember that. And I remember it feeling very effective and new back when private Ryan came out. And I wondered if it held up or if it was overused. Right. Just in my memory was, I was wondering if that was the case. And I rewatched 
pri- Private Ryan recently, and it's no, it's perfect. <laughs> it's, it's used very effectively. That's another movie, by the way. I'm looking forward to talking through with you one of these days. Oh yeah, oh man, that movie. Speaking of that movie, and then this movie, these, those are movies that are quite long. Yeah, but then they breeze, they breeze by. I mean, they're they earn their length. Yeah, and and you know uh, the the extended version, which I I think is fine, um, but I I I don't think it's it's necessary. You know, I uh, I was I was sort of doing a comparison with with the theatrical in this one, and and I think I think Ridley Scott's instinct with with regards to to which version to, to make for the theaters were correct here. Mm-hmm. You know, as opposed to like, like, uh, you know, uh, Kingdom of Heaven, which is c- a couple years after this. I think I think most people most people generally agree that his theatrical sorry, the the the, the extended edition is kind of one of his great films. Mm-hmm. And the theatrical cut really did a disservice to that, you know. Right. Yeah, I yeah, like I said, I, I must have seen it because I know some of the deleted scenes, but. Um, I thought this version worked just fine. Unlike something like Napoleon recently, <laughs> right? Where it, it yeah. felt a little more vignette-y yep. and just not very effective. Like it, you go into each scene and it, they're well acted and you're like, okay, but I don't feel like I got a sense of characters overall. Right. And I don't know if the director's cut corrects that or not. I haven't watched it, but I am, I'm, I'm not going to take that, that, that trip <laughs> I, yeah, I, I yeah, spent I quite know. enough time with that character exactly but but for this this film i mean these are excellent characters yeah you know so i'm not i don't feel like i'm missing anything see for those who think game of thrones was where the the incest uh, subplot entered the discourse right well, we got a gladiator beat him there by by a decade or so way to go gladiator yeah <laughs> <laughs> Check that out. I mean, that's kind of like an old. I, I am not a huge, uh, you know, history. I enjoy history movies and shows and things and documentaries and whatnot. But I, I am not well read on all this stuff. But it's my understanding that a lot of royalty. That's kind of how it went down, right? To keep yeah, bloodlines pure and yeah, um, literally, pretty grody. Yeah, so so the this is it's it's interesting to watch this now, knowing that Joaquin Phoenix is considered you know one of our great actors, right? Mm-hmm. And at the time, he was considered a good actor, but I would say it was this movie and the Academy Award nomination he got uh, along with it that really put him on a different tier. Maybe moving past being River Phoenix's brother. Yeah, you know, and uh, like he had been doing stuff and he 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 was not you, you know, it, it's not like anybody was dismissing him, but I think uh I think what he does here and it's so interesting cuz Commodus is just the worst. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> Yeah, yeah. You talk about like just a hated movie villain. He's certainly up there, right? Oh, yeah. And yet I what I find compelling is that he's not entirely wrong for carrying the rage inside him that he does right right because his dad is kind of an asshole sure this guy right here mm-hmm. richard not richard harris uh, i'm sure he was a lovely person but marcus <laughs> 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 yeah yeah dumbledore yeah i mean yeah dumbledore exactly you know because because the whole thing is he's he's you know told his son look man i'm preparing you to succeed me Mm-hmm. This is your whole your whole life is going to be dedicated all the training everything oh and then psh, psych not really right pretty pretty dickish I gotta say yeah but he does uh, have a lot of uh, negative qualities <laughs> who, who Commodus yeah 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 not not a good guy by any yeah. means uh, and it's yeah. worth mentioning actually that as a as a matter of just historical record marcus aurelius did not in fact want to return rome to a republic in fact he he was the one who reinstated the idea of uh the the monarchy passing uh, to the 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 son and they even ruled together for a couple of years before marcus aurelius died so entirely fabricated mm-hmm. and not uh in the bosom of his son being suffocated but by the plague that's so, by the plague yes yeah it's kind of interesting, right? I mean, 
I have to look these things up. You know, the, the Roman Empire is not my Roman Empire, <laughs> so to speak. <laughs> um, so I, you know, I wouldn't catch these things as I'm watching the film. But it is just interesting, the liberties. I mean, I, I think of Braveheart, you mm-hmm. know, where it's like, well, let's just take this guy and then we'll just come up with some cool stuff. And it doesn't matter if it happened centuries earlier and this person wasn't even there or, you know, <laughs> right. just sort of take these figures because it's old enough and just sort of concoct your own story. Yeah. And, and I'm somebody, and I'm sure you would agree. Look, it's like the, these are not documents, you know, these are entertainments right. and we should know that going in, you know, so don't, don't look to this for your, to, in lieu of a history book. Right. However, I personally, I, it does irk me when you have these, these huge deviations from history when, when being truer to, to the certainly like actual events would not damage the film any. Mm, sure. Um, you know, but th- this, as far as these things go, this is not as egregious about that as Braveheart, for example. Right. Right. Which is just cartoonish in how it, how it treats historical <laughs> events. <laughs> the liberties. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of Braveheart, worth mentioning that, that, uh, Mel Gibson had been offered this part before, before it made its way to Russell Crowe. Sure. You can picture it. Yeah. Mel Gibson, who was 43 at the time. I was like, I'm too old for this shit. <laughs> wow. <laughs> that is and, weird to realize, right? Because because that means that that uh, Lethal Weapon 4, which is like the old Riggs movie, he's, mm-hmm. he's like 40, 41 in that. Isn't that wild? And that's how old Danny Glover was when he literally said, I, uh, he's too old for this shit. Yeah. Uh, I think Hugh Jackman was in the list here um, for this movie. There are a couple other people, but... But you have to admit the right guy got oh, it. Oh yeah, one hundred percent. Yep. You know. Um, it's interesting too. I was thinking about just like the evolution evolution of the uh, on screen hero, right? Where I saw Schwarzenegger's name. I guess they were looking at him for Proximo at one point, mm-hmm. and I mean, so oh, I not totally as see that. Maximus, but. But it just makes you think, you know, in the 80s or something where you have Conan and it's Schwarzenegger and you have Stallone and then you sort of have your, you know, a little bit more everyman kind of era, I guess, probably ushered in by Bruce Willis and Die Hard. And, mm-hmm. you know, you get Russell Crowe here who's kind of beefy, but he doesn't look like. I was going to bring that up. Yeah. He doesn't have like a, like a Hemsworth physique. Exactly. You know? Isn't that kind of funny? And then now we're in this funny era where it's sort of both almost like you have these people getting unnaturally cut yeah <laughs> right you know like your krasinski's or your kumal nanjiani's and stuff but you also have action films starring bob odenkirk <laughs> yeah that's true right and you're like oh yeah that was cool <laughs> so it's just what, kinda... what what i and my i haven't seen the new one but just from what i see with regards to paul mescal in the new film you know it it seems like he doesn't have a superhero physique he's got like a normal fit guy physique yeah yeah i i could be wrong i haven't seen him him shirtless so anyway my point is like maybe like maybe a little bit of a swing back towards normalcy with regards to what's considered a a healthy male body you know yeah yeah well and it's funny because we don't tend to have the Schwarzeneggers and the Stallones these days, say for someone like Dwayne Johnson. Right. Which is kind of interesting, right? That is interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I think, well, to that point, I think, I think part of the reason this movie works, I mean, it, it was a, um, you know, a, 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 a mass appeal blockbuster, right? So mm-hmm. it, it's not, it, it, it's got a human story that, appeals to all audiences. Right. And so it's not really about, you know, macho posturing and, you know, it, 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 there's, there's a story there and there are action sequences, but I mean, it's been my experience that women really like this movie, Mm. you know, uh, which I found would not, you wouldn't think so for a movie like this, you know? Sure. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, there's something too I was thinking halfway through where I was just so on Maximus's side and just like mm-hmm. looking up to him the way that the the men in his military would. And I'm like, there's something about like the noble hero, mm-hmm. you know, like someone with integrity and nobility and just, you know, he doesn't want to do this, but when forced to do it, he still operates with integrity. 
right. you know, and rallies people together and people are inspired by him. And there's just, there's something to that type of character. Well, well this scene right here, right? Yeah, like, well, sure. <laughs> right. He, he's just kind of, he's, he's the general, but he's go, you know, he's just uh, among the soldiers and he's just laughing and, you know, and, and that's, uh, that's how he garners their respect, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And then you have that amazing moment uh, when he's in the arena, right? And uh, they, they, uh, the Romans tell him to put their weapons down. Yep. And then his men look to him like, and then he's like, oh, nods, okay. And they're like, okay. <laughs> like, <laughs> they'll right. listen to him. They won't listen to the emperor. <laughs> I feel like that scene they put in there deliberately just to be like, no, he is, uh, Commodus is a, a, a physical force also, you know? Yeah, yeah. I had that same feeling. Um, just knowing where it heads in the end, just so you know, the, uh, like he would be able to hold his own at least momentarily against Max. Right. In, right. In a fight. You so know, Richard, it, it was, r- yeah, r- sorry, real quick. I, r- Richard Harris kind of had a run here and near, near the end of his life where he had gladiator. And then of course he was Dumbledore in the first couple uh, of Harry Potter films. And, uh, in the middle there, he was in Count of Monte Cristo, you know, and of course he, Richard Harris is a, a great Shakespearean actor, a great, great legacy. But it's, I think for many people, he's locked in their brain as looking like this, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. With, with the, with the wispy long hair and the white beard, you know, but yeah. it's a great performance here. It's, it's interesting because, because uh, again, like, like the, the, the character sort of ends up causing a lot of the problems that ensue. Right. But he mm-hmm. has to be sympathetic because we have to like him because Mar- Maximus likes him, you know, mm-hmm. and it, it's, it's a delicate act. And I think, I think Richard Harris is like the right actor to be able to embody that. Definitely. Sorry. You were saying, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, I was just going to say, I think another thing, um, when I talk about this movie being long, but you're never bored. I mean, when you have, this is a very long scene of two characters conversing and we're learning about you know each of them we're learning about their relationship together we're learning about things that forward the plot and it just it's it's funny to me how much i was reading about people not loving the script right and i'm like i I find this scene just completely like engaging and and wholly listenable like i'm leaning forward hanging on every word because i feel like it's so engaging and and well written and i don't know i I, it's just funny to me how often i was reading that and i I, you know i'm sure on the day they were improving upon things and 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 things like that but i don't know i actually think it's a it's a pretty good script (laughs) personally i i think so well it's tricky right because because you can see this dialogue being very prosaic if it's not if it's not delivered right Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so, so it speaks to the utility of having these, these giants on the screen. And it's like, thank God you have them to deliver your words, you know? Yeah. And I mean, it's just, and everyone is speaking in a way that we don't speak. Like it, it is, it has its own whatever wave. I always use the word wavelength, but it does like, it has its own sort of wavelength of, like you say, being maybe, maybe prosaic or verbose or whatever it is. But like, I don't know, I guess maybe, all right, fine. Russell Crowe, you're right. You are a great actor. <laughs> you well, know, well, th- you this made right it work. here th- where, where Maximus is describing his home. That's Russell Crowe describing his home. Yeah. I read that. And so you see a lot of that throughout this film where, you know, Crow has talked about this multiple times that, that they, they started shooting with about 22 usable pages of script. Right. And, and so, which is bonkers when you think about it. Right. <laughs> yeah. R- right. Like, I, I mean, it, it wasn't, it, it was one of those things where they had a full script, but not, not, they weren't happy with any of it. And I'm like, how do you, how do you call action without having a script completely locked in? Um, and, and I suppose that's a testament to Ridley Scott and, and his sense of like, well, I know what I want and I'll figure out how to get it, you know? Yeah. So, I mean, what I'm praising is the end result here. So who knows? Yeah. What well, it's a process. With. I mean, what you're really pointing out is how it's the words on the page are not enough. Mm-hmm. 
you have to have the actors who who imbue them with emotion. You have to have the filmmaker who has the overall picture sketched out in his own mind. I mean, there's so many pieces where at any point it could fall apart. And and this is sort of alchemy. You know, we've talked, uh, you know, The Fugitive is like that, where it's just mm, somehow yeah. they, they they started shooting and the movie they ended up with is not what they started, but it it's amazing, you know? Yep. Yeah. I mean, I was reading about different drafts, different writers brought on and the whole thing with his family being killed. I mean, that wasn't even in the original drafts that they were agreed yeah, to make. It was a John Logan edition, I believe. Yeah. Which is the movie. <laughs> you know? Isn't that crazy? Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and there were versions where, where Maximus survives. Mm. Um, and, and again, I, I think that's the true mark of a good film is where it ends and you're like, they made this the only version of this movie they could have made mm-hmm. and yet you realize all the all the the di- potential digressions they could have had along the way you know yeah yeah it almost gives you or at least uh it does for me like a little bit of hope when i'm writing things and you're just <laughs> like oh yeah like you know <laughs> miracles don't just appear when you put pen mm-hmm. to page right away it takes a lot of yeah. work it takes a lot of input you know <laughs> you're right yeah a lot of writing is rewriting ah, just look at that. i mean just all the details I don't, yeah <laughs> that's something yeah. i was really taken with while watching this i mean just so much i don't know the set dressing and the little smoke wisps of smoke everywhere and it just feels yeah. very very alive well, and, and this film's success did kind of, uh, you know, signal a bit of a rebirth for big, you know, large scale historical epics, you know? Right. Right. Troy uh, and Alexander and Alexander. Yeah. What else? Well, yeah, Kingdom Troy, of Heaven came after this. Kingdom of Heaven and Troy, I think were both 2004. Um, I don't think, I don't think anything. And then of course you had Lord of the Rings like a year later, which is a different type of epic but but i don't know that anything in the wake of gladiator performed as well as gladiator yeah you know and i think i i don't remember those movies as well to be honest but i think the thing that i take away most out of this isn't the action i mean it's the story it's the the character's journey and what he went through and how much i want him to get out of situations and you know to get back home so to speak Yeah. You know, and I think that really does come through this. Like that is probably, I mean, certainly that's why it wins best picture. Right. I mean, the story, not the spectacle per se. Um, Right. And why people connected with it the way that they did, you know, why people love the character of Maximus. It's not because he just does cool things with a sword. I mean, he's like, we we were speaking to earlier. I mean, he's a great character and he is made up of great character. Hmm. Yeah someone that you kind of can look up to in a way and root for. Yeah. And ultimately for a story like this, it, 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 it rises or falls based on that. Yeah. Right. And, and, you know, we, we've talked often on this show about the, in, in storytelling terms, the idea of righteous vengeance mm-hmm. and, and you set up a scenario where the, the injustice inflicted on your main character is so severe that you, you sort of sign off on whatever, uh, he or she needs to do to rectify that. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. to me, this is a good example of that, you know, because it's, it's, it's so horrible what he goes through Yep, that we're just waiting for that, for, for, you know, for that moment of uppance, mm-hmm. you know, it's yep. very, you know, we were talking, it's very similar. Count of Monte Cristo is, is like this, that same template. Uh, ben Hur is like this mm-hmm. same template, you know, it's it's a sturdy framework. You can hang lots of different stories on it. Definitely. This here, I love this. That Russell Crowe talked about how um, this whole prayer and everything it was just something he he came up with this on the spot because these figurines were just set dressing, right? That had been put there, and so he kind of just in the course of doing this prayer, he picks up these figurines and plays it as if they are they are his family, and it ended up becoming this meaningful runner for the whole film so yeah, much that. so that that tommy flanagan right here who was just supposed he was just like a day player for this 
And, and Ridley Scott was like, no, 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 we're going to, I want to bring those figurines back. We want to bring him back. So he ended up working for like three months on this movie and he was just supposed to do one day. Wow. Oh, I like that. <laughs> that's right. great. Well, and he has that great moment later. Yeah. Oh, yeah. that's right. Because he hands off the things. That's, oh, wow. Right. That's great. <laughs> so it was literally like, we want to figure something out about the figurines. We don't know exactly yet. So take him with us to, you know, wherever they shot the, the Coliseum stuff. Mm hmm. And so he's just chilling over there, you know, and, and by the way, Tommy Flanagan is terrific in this movie, but he is, he's, he's one of those, Hey, that guys mm-hmm. who's had a hell of a career. Cause he, he was in Braveheart before this. Right. But then, you know, he was on uh sons of anarchy, et cetera, you know, and, and very distinctive face, but this is a very, very early role for him here. Hmm. See, I went that, that, that bust right there. I just had this memory of, uh, Phoenix, like sw- swinging a sword at it or something. Mm-hmm. And I guess that's a deleted scene. Then again, I mean, going back to the early DVD days, maybe that's something where I, you know, <laughs> watched the movie and then went through all the deleted One scenes. The deleted scenes. Got... Maybe that's that. That sounds right because because they, they put out the extended cut a couple of years later. But I I I feel like the the that original two disc DVD. I remember. I feel like it had deleted scenes on it. Yeah. Yeah. I also read somewhere that they uh, broadcast this on ABC, the extended version, and they showed it over two nights. Oh, so maybe you saw that. Yeah. Doesn't that feel like something from a bygone era? It really does. (laughs) Wow. Yeah. Yeah, Phoenix is so good in this. Yeah, you know, uh, before this, he had done, like, he had been in stuff, because I knew him before this. Yeah, well, Parenthood, for sure. Right, uh, to right. die for, which is really oh, good. Wow, Nicole I Kidman, about that. Gus Van Sant movie. Yeah. Uh, he was in Inventing the Abbots. U turn. Inventing the Abbots. That's the, that's the first time I remember seeing his name and like making a connection. Yeah, and, and then Eight Millimeter. Remember eight that? Millimeter he's in and uh, um, Return to Paradise. Yep, yep, right. And then Gladiator. Yeah. So. Kind yeah. By the way, one of his first gigs was as this little superpowered kid in an episode of Superboy, the syndicated TV series. Hmm. When he was still known as Leaf, he was still Leaf Phoenix back then. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. So I mean, it, it, like obviously now, you know, with Walk the Line and Joker, again, you know, he's he's on a different tier. But it, when he when he got cast in this, even he was like, "What am I doing here?" You know, hmm. he he didn't trust that he had the 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 ability to encapsulate this character. And so it says something about Ridley Scott sort of seeing something there, Mm -hmm. you know, Ridley Scott, by the way, worth mentioning that, that this movie came at a good time for him because the nineties were not, were not a particularly great period in terms of his movies uh, striking a chord with audiences. Yeah, actually I had just pulled up his IMDb because I wanted, I did for a lot of people. I wanted to see where we were at in the timeline when this was coming out. So yeah, what do we have here? We got, I mean, Th- Thelma and Louise was like 91, right? Yeah. Oh, that, 1492. I forgot all about that. That was a calamitous. Mm-hmm. And then White he did Squall. like G.I. White Squall, which nobody watched. And it was too bad because that wasn't a bad movie. Uh, G.I. Jane, which I, I've seen it. I couldn't tell you what it's about. Yeah, I don't remember it. Right. Uh, and so that, that's he, it. He was struggling this? a little bit in the 90s. Yep. Yep. So this came at the right time. But then after this, oh, Hannibal, he did right after. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Black Hawk Down, Matchstick Men, which I love. I feel like that's a really underrated movie. Matchstick Men I like, yeah. Yeah, Kingdom of Heaven, American Gangster. I mean, I feel like after Gladiator, because it feels like in the 90s, he was putting out a movie once every couple of years. And then after Gladiator, he's just like, it's like he has not stopped working. Mm-hmm, Yeah. This scene always makes me uncomfortable when Commodus is killing, uh, killing Mark. I don't know, Brian. I don't know. I don't know if this is controversial. Patricide makes me uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah, I have. I I think I'm on the uh, anti-patricide uh, side of that divide. You know, I didn't know you were going to say that, but I actually I fall on the same side with you. Well, we we may be part of a minority. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe, maybe I mean, it'd be one thing to poison him, you know, or to sick an assassin on him, but to like be holding him against your body as he's squirming, struggling. Yeah, to man. I mean, it's so it's, disturbing. It, it, yeah, it, it makes me, 
I mean, we're supposed to, we're not supposed to be like, go, go, go get him, Commodus. So, so <laughs> it, it is having the proper reaction, but it, it certainly, uh, it, it tells us something about his character, you know, the, the cruelty that he's capable of. Yep. Yeah. I watched something the other night. I don't remember what it was, but it was someone smothering another person with a pillow. Mm-hmm. And it occurred to me then, and it occurs to me now, what if it didn't work? That'd be really <laughs> awkward. <laughs> you know what I mean? You have to like, wake up. They're like, what, what were you doing? Yeah. yeah. What, what are you trying to do? What, why is that pillow in your hand? You know? Yeah. And Thanksgiving is, is a little more awkward after that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which is funny. This speaking of Game of Thrones earlier, there was like a similar sort of thing, right? Where Ned Stark had been told that he was going to be in charge, but uh, if the person who tells you that you're going to be in charge dies and no one else hears it, not great. Yeah, you got to get that shit notarized and yep. <laughs> call in a couple witnesses. Yep. And then Ned Stark uh, loses his head, doesn't he? That's correct. Yeah, I've not seen the show, but I could carry on a pretty decent conversation about Game of Thrones. Oh, man, that was huge in the conversation. It's funny when you watch movies from the 2010s, how often it gets referenced. Right. You know, it's just something that's so in the culture that they felt they could even reference it in movies. Characters could mm-hmm. reference it in movies. And it's just funny. You know, you watch it now and you're like, oh, that was such a moment. <laughs> There's something about people being slapped in movies, right? That's just so powerful when someone's like disgusted with someone and they just give them a Yeah. Slap. It's like when, when Katie Holmes smacks uh, Christian Bale, you know, in Batman Begins. Yeah, exactly. Y- you feel that a little more. Yeah. There's something. So, so, you know, J-Lo was one of the people who auditioned to play Lucilla. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. And yeah, it's it's hard for you to picture that because like, I do think Kanye Nielsen is is pretty terrific in this, but but certainly, I, like d- circa two thousand J Lo, I can I can I guess I can I can imagine it, you know. But it's, it's I can imagine it. I mean, that's post out of sight, right? Right. Uh, yes, that's right. Right. Because that was ninety eight. Yeah. So she'd proven herself, but uh... yeah, no, I I think it worked out just fine. So this character Quintus, so he's played by T- Tomas Arana, who's another hey that guy, because mm-hmm. you know he's in Hunt for Red October and he's in L.A. Confidential also actually. Um, now here here's my thought about this. Qu- Quintus kind of gets his like redemption moment at the end. Mm-hmm. I don't think he deserves that redemption moment because I think what he does is pretty shitty. Yeah, yeah. Right. Cause, cause when you think about it, he's like, Quintus, br- give me your word. You'll look after my family. He could have just lied and been like, yeah, I will. Yes. 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 That, that would have gone a long way if we saw a little eye dart, like, no, right. he's not going to do it, but he's at least lying, lying to his friend, knowing his yeah. friend about to die. Totally yeah. agree. Right. Yeah. So I don't know. <laughs> That's my thought on that. Yeah. Yeah. By the way, did you know that, uh, the woman who plays Maximus's wife is really Scott's wife? I did not know that, but yeah. uh, good for Ridley Scott. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, she she is quite striking, I will say. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, she appears in most of his movies, and I think she produces some of them. Is that right? Wow, I I had no idea. Oh man, it always makes me so nervous when people are holding the blade end of a weapon. Right. <laughs> I, just, I hate in movies when people make blood oaths. And they like slice their palms. I'm like, oh. well, one thing this movie taught me is that the frost makes your sword stick. And yeah, that's right. Can, that's right. Carry that piece of wisdom with me through thick and thin. Yeah. Uh, across a fruited plain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I like the execution here too. You know, where what he's doing is pretty superhuman. Right. But it's not like it's all played pretty uh, realistically. You know what I mean? Like yeah, within, anything, within a certain range of, of what's believable. Exactly. I like, I like yeah. that they, you know, I think there's a, maybe to compete with superhero movies or something, but sometimes there's a tendency to try to elevate action because they movies feel like they need to compete. Yeah. And then, you know, you lose a little bit of the, I don't know, fair similitude or something. 
Yeah, it's you know when we talk about superhero movies, it's worth recognizing this movie came out uh, the first Friday of May in the year two thousand. Which you know nowadays the first Friday of May is sort of reserved for Marvel movies. Yeah, yeah, sure. And and it is remarkable to to think of how this was the big summer kickoff movie. Mm-hmm. Right, and and like like now we we got the new one coming out and and they they got that coming out in the fall and i i suspect it'll it'll play through the holidays but there's almost this recognition oh we can't we can't put it out the first weekend of may cuz the audience's expectations have changed so much you know it's so true but then there's almost part of me i wonder how part 2 is going to do i imagine it will do fine i um, i think fine is kind of where i'm at yeah yeah, I think it'll do like, oh, okay, good. We're, we're happy. You know, I mean, I don't know that it's going to do on the level of this one, but I would love for them to try to put it in May. Like, maybe we could try to reclaim a little bit of these types of movies as events that everyone has to check out, you know? Uh, well, if you remember, this past this past May, they put The Fall Guy out that weekend. Yeah, which was fine, you know? But, I mean, sort of like a more goofy in tone Sure, sure. I just mean as a non-superhero offering. Oh, you know? No, no, no. You're. I see what you're saying. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, yeah. It's not. <laughs> it's not Gladiator, but yeah. Um, I. I think. Look, I think good movies are good movies, and I. I think on some level, you know, the box office is irrelevant because if it's good, it'll be good forever, and if it's bad, it'll be bad forever. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, I think Gladiator. It just worked, but it. But it does. It does speak to how. I mean, summer of 2000, let's think about it. That summer, there was one superhero movie and it was X-Men. Mm. Right. But other than, th- and actually when you think about it, the fact that, um, Russell Crowe did this, which is, he, he had been offered X-Men. Mm, you can see it. And yeah. he, he, he wasn't able to, th- to do it. And so he suggested Hugh Jackman. Wow. Right. And, and, and Hugh Jackman has even said, like, I owe my career to Russell Crowe. I know? was just going to say. Right. I mean, his entire career, just right. uh, his friend. Uh, what about my friend? Yeah, and and really, when he, both of them ended up doing pretty well based on the choices, right? Yeah. Uh, original Wolverine, do Gray Scott less so because he, you know, he, he <laughs> <laughs> broke his leg or whatever, making yeah. making Mission Impossible. But that summer this is my point. You had you had Mission Impossible two. You had Gladiator. You had uh, you know. Um, uh, Shaft with Sam Jackson, the first one. You had X Men. I mean, it, it feels like there was this variety of, of different types of movies. Mm-hmm. So, summer was not just like filling. You know, it was not like eight superhero movies spread out. You know, mm-hmm. and I'm all about those superhero movies. I'm all about that superhero movie life. However, it's nice to have variety too. One hundred percent. I don't want them to go anywhere, but I just uh, would love to see a diverse you know, population during the summer. I, I agree. It's pretty horrifying. This, this scene is obviously, yeah, I was going to say it's, it's, it's horrific. Uh, that all said, I, I think um, once you're, once you're willing to just let the snot flow, flow freely, uh, <laughs> boy, you just make space on your mantle for that Oscar. <laughs> That's really funny. I mean, you know, snot acting, I'm like kind of on the fence about. Yeah. Like sometimes it can feel a little actory. <laughs> or like you know, like little bits of drool coming down and things. But God, look at his eyes, man. Look at that snot, man. Uh. <laughs> like you know what? It's like snot aside. I believe his eyes. Uh. <laughs> that man is wounded. Eyes aside, I believe a snot. <laughs> <laughs> I wish we were on the like an Oscar board debating who should win. And this is like me and you in the microphones, like <laughs> like lobbying for Russell Crowe. But this is like how we're doing it. <laughs> you know, the eyes are the window to the soul. You know, I feel the snot. <laughs> the snot is the river from the nose, which flows from the soul also. <laughs> so there. Anyway, we both think that Russell Crowe should be nominated for Best best Actor. There you go. And, and that's how he won his Oscar. <laughs> I mean, when you look at look at the Best Picture nominees that year, right? I mean, it was a pretty pretty impressive list, right? Because you had you had Traffic, you had Aaron mm-hmm. Brockovich. Um, 
What else? What, Crouching Tiger, I think, was that year. Whoa. Wow. Right? Because because if you remember, Ridley Scott did not win Best Director. So Gladiator right. got Best Picture. That wound is so nasty, by the way. It grosses so me gross. out every time I see it. <laughs> so gross. Those maggots. So I'm just looking at the, for, for 2000, so, well, the movies that came out in 2000, but were nominated in 2001, right? Mm-hmm. We got, uh, well, what, what was that year? Hold on. I love all the uh, sort of trippiness that we see throughout as well. I mean, we have these sort of, uh, you know, his hands over the wheat, which is kind of like right. artistic. These weird, like afterlife visions but kind af- of. Exactly. But then also just even this, like the whole thing where the camera and, and crow are sort of still, but he's moving over landscapes in sort of like a dreamlike fashion. Right. It just all. Yeah. Well, I, I think it's important because there has to be a reality to what happens at the end when he's reunited with his family in the afterlife. Right. For it to feel satisfying as you're walking. Exactly. Out. Yep. Right. Because, because I was watching this earlier today with my wife and it was that scene and she's like, Oh, it's nice. He's reunited with his family. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, no, he's not. We don't know what happens. <laughs> right. Right. Well, we know it's dead. nothing. Right? Yeah. <laughs> I was like, he's dead and that's it for all we know, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, that's, but the, we have to believe that there is a happy ending there, you know? Absolutely. It reminds me of Titanic. I mean, it's like the genius of Titanic that they reunite them yeah. at the end. That's right. It's, it's so, I mean, really on the face of it, it's, it's pretty hokey, right? Yep. It's like every character in the film is just staying there clapping for them. And they're like, Hey, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> like the top of a staircase, but it works. You walk out <laughs> with a smile on your face. The, the movie creates the re the, the, the framework for you to be satisfied. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So this actor who's talking to, to Oliver Reed, he was in uh, the mummy. He's That's right. The, the warden, you know? Yep. He's, he's a, he's a, he's an English stand up comedian. So his actual accent, he's got a very thick cockney accent. Oh, funny. So, but he's found a, he's found a rich vein playing like skeezy, vaguely middle Eastern characters. <laughs> That's so funny. Yeah. So Oliver Reed croaked while making this movie. <laughs> yeah, that's that is factually true. He, he keeled over in the middle of taking shots at some bar in Malta. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. Oh, he literally drank himself to death. Wow. And and that in and of itself is fascinating. First of all, he and, he and Russell Crowe did not get on. Um which one can imagine because Oliver Reed in his day was, was uh, a pretty well-regarded actor and, you know, he had fallen off a bit. And so, you know, fallen prey to his, his, uh, you know, his, his addiction obviously. But, mm-hmm. but uh, what's more interesting to me is the professionalism of them on, you know, like Oliver Reed's alcoholism, notwithstanding, he is magnetic in this movie. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, and he, he becomes so integral a character that what it's, it's amazing to me how they formulated an exit for his character. The original version of the script, to, to, such as it was the one they were shooting, the plan was not for Proximo to die. Mm-hmm. And yet you watch it and you're like, well, he had to die. Cause that's the perfect ending for his character. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And they, they invented it out of whole cloth. Well, it completely works. Yeah. Yeah. Wasn't uh, at least one of the original endings where as punishment, they were going to make uh, Maximus have to fight him in the ring. That was, yeah. I don't know how far along in the process, but that was, that was one of them. Yeah. Yeah. Which would be pretty awful. Well, that only makes sense if you're talking about a Schwarzenegger type. Mm, Yeah, sure. Sure. Right. Yeah, it's funny. These look, uh, just looking at these sort of warriors here, these gladiators' bodies, they do look, you know, they look tough, but, you know, what we were saying earlier, they don't look like ripped. Like I think, yeah, they try to make it, normal look, fit. No. Yeah. I mean, even, even the, the, um, the, the Rolf Muller character, you know, who, who's training them, mm-hmm. he's, um, 
you know, he he played um he played Conan on the syndicated Conan series. Oh. And you know, he's got like a a beefy physique. He looks again, he looks fit, but it's it's weird how our our expectations have have gotten so out of whack thanks to what we see and stuff. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. Like he doesn't look like a warrior per se to my eyes. Now he looks more like a bouncer. <laughs> That's right. Exactly. Yeah. Ulfar is the character's name, by the way. Yeah. He was like a riding buddy of Arnold Schwarzenegger. Like they would work out together, ride motorcycles together. He's even in Batman and Robin as like one of the people in the jail. Oh, funny. He's uh, you know, you know, in, in Batman and Robin, like um, there's Jesse Ventura is one of the, the guards. Mm-hmm. And there's another guard and he, he plays that guy. Oh, funny. And actually that guy is, he's a pretty good, good. He is. He's a good character in this film. This mm-hmm. guy, you know, I, it, you feel something when he when he leaves the story, you know. Definitely, yeah. A lot of great side characters in this. You know, they, I think Juba, uh, Jaiman Hunsu's character, he's great. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. They may not get a lot of moments, but you remember those moments. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Which, by the way, reminds me, uh, Jaiman Hunsu. I've not seen Amistad, but the writer, he wrote Amistad, right? And that's how he yeah, met Brand- Spielberg. And, yeah, and he yeah. and then pitched this to Spielberg and Spielberg was like, cool, but uh, I've not seen I'm a side of you. I have not seen it. Yeah. I, I should like Anthony Hopkins, Matthew McConaughey, um, Jaiman Hunsu. Like I, I know I will like it. Right. Yeah. I guess maybe it just, yeah, it always felt like it'd be kind of rough and there's, you know, just certain movies yeah. you have to be willing <laughs> to, to go into those worlds. Yeah, that, uh, uh, or or you can you know you can you can take uh, the Quentin Tarantino approach and go into those worlds and just just see them all all the bad people just being you know obliterated. <laughs> right, right, that is kind of like Spielberg does Schindler's List. Tarantino does Inglorious Bastards. You know, mm-hmm. Spielberg does Amistad. Tarantino does Django. You know, <laughs> that's yeah, it's pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> I love that moment where they were just walking toward the arena there. I don't even know what's really going on, but there's red dye being poured onto them and yeah. the cloth dangling from the top. I don't even know what's going on. I'm sure that comes from some sort of research or, you know, based on something, but it's just so like I'm saying, like with how this movie feels so lived in. I, I'm used to movies now, especially ones that have, a, you know, they have to come up with all these older looking backgrounds and they just feel a little flatter. Right. Yeah. And this just feels so dusty and lived in. And I don't know. I don't know. It, it felt really exhilarating watching it, just looking at this movie last night. And, and, you know, it's not like they didn't use visual effects, right? I mean, there of are course. These digital extensions and stuff. So, so you, you see this marriage of the practical and the digital in ways that are, that, that disguise, uh, you know, the, the seams. So, mm-hmm. so you're not taken in you know, you're not distracted by the digital parts of it. Yeah. Yeah. And I, you know, I, it's, it's, uh, I can imagine in some instances, you know, you have the volume now where it feels like, well, they can control all the elements. They don't have to worry about the sun going down. They don't have to worry about a cloudy day, you know, right. and Hey, fair in, in some cases, but in other cases, you know, those lights just don't look like the sun. You yeah. Know, you just that's... You can't replace the sun. So, you, you know, you, you gotta, you gotta pick your battles, I suppose, you know, and I just, uh, some people are a little more skillful at it than others. It, it's obviously when you've got somebody like Ridley Scott, who, who I think he's, he's on another level in terms of his ability to not only know what technology offers, but what he can do within that technology and what he can do to push that technology. Right. Mm-hmm. And so, so he's, he, you know, I put, I put Ridley Scott in the same bucket as, as a Spielberg or a James Cameron or, you know, mm-hmm. oh, yeah. these are consummate craftsmen, right. Christopher Nolan, you know? Yep. I thought this no, battle. Like, I, I, yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Well, they do a really good job of making some distinguish, distinguishing features with some of these people. Right, like the guy with the right. spiky hair. So then I'm like, oh crap, spiky hair guy got it. You know, spiky and then, <laughs> you know, and then the, the poor guy who's like peeing himself. Then when I see him get killed, I'm like, oh no, nervous guy. Yes, you sir. know, 
<laughs> instead of just seeing like dudes dispatched, right? It's like this really fast shorthand to make me actually care just a little bit more. Well, the other thing is they establish right away how how Maximus's skill as a battlefield strategist translate to him being in a gladiatorial arena. Right, right. Right, and kind of, you know, it, he... he I I love how up until they reach Rome, nobody knows who he is. And so, but, but he's already earned their loyalty well before they know he's a general. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. You know, it's funny because I had seen some people say, you know, like these games, they're presented as despicable in this story. And yet we are watching a movie <laughs> where we're right. watching. We're like, the game. And, yeah. But, you <laughs> know <what? him. laughs> I, <laughs> but the, I think what's, what's uh, brilliant about it is we're not the people in the stands watching this. We're watching people who don't want to be in there and rooting for them to get out of these situations. So in a way I feel like it saves you a little bit from being complicit. <laughs> right. We have the backstory. Well, so, yeah, and we don't we don't want this to happen. We just want him to survive it. We want him to get out of it. We're not there to just watch like who's going to kill who. I, I, you know? I like that, Brian. That's good, right? That's I I, I concur with your analysis. I think it's, we're on the side of the people who have no choice. There you go. Look at this. Yeah, take that. Glad yeah, movie haters. <laughs> <laughs> no, I definitely remember that part of the conversation. Like this is the pre think piece era of, of, uh, you know, the early aughts. Right. But you'd still get those occasional pieces, uh, you know, that were, you know, uh, ostensible hot takes. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, well, everybody's cheering for the gladiators. Are we living in Rome? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Are you not entertained? <laughs> <laughs> That's... <laughs> shut up ethan <laughs> that was a name pulled out of a hat as not in any specific to anyone <laughs> i was gonna say jeff but i say jeff too much so I was like, <laughs> no no ethan is good i like that yeah <laughs> so other uh best picture nominees that year we have traffic yeah. aaron brockovich uh crouching tiger and uh, chocolat. Mm. I know. I know you're a big fan of chocolat. We. <laughs> oui. I, uh, I don't think I've seen that one, to be honest. I actually have seen it. I don't remember much about it. But uh, Crouching Tiger. Oh man, that was a big one for me. I was such a fan of that. I I definitely remember. I was going to film school at the time, and this is the stuff film nerds argued about back then. <laughs> but, like Crouching Tiger should have won. It's bullshit that gladiator won sure 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 and and i look back at that now and i'm like you dorks every single time <laughs> including myself in that in that conversation yeah. sure sure that's really <laughs> funny um i love this yeah he enters like a conquering hero but what has he conquered um it's very funny too when phoenix it, it, you know, joins his father at the beginning of the movie. And he's like, have I missed it? Have I missed the war? <laughs> you know, it's just so, it's so cringy. You're like, what, a, what an idiot. <laughs> Spencer treat Clark uh, later this year, he would be in uh, unbreakable. Yeah. 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 He's, he was popping up a lot in this moment. And he, he's still acting and stuff. So that, that's kind of nice to see too, you know, like, yeah, yeah. Well, I should say I, I remember him a lot. All the things I remember him, yeah, Unbreakable and everything. Um, Mystic River, I think. Yeah, he had, he was in a couple episodes of uh, Agents of Shield. Okay, as a as a grown up, you know. Derek Jacoby, uh, you know, he's a great, great Shakespearean actor. One of his one of my favorite roles of his. He played. He was in an episode of Frasier, mm -hmm. as this Shakespearean actor who Frazier had seen as a, as when he was a kid and it, you know, inspired his love of Shakespeare, but now he's been reduced to like act, showing up at sci-fi conventions. Cause he played like a robot on some sci-fi show. <laughs> and so Frazier's like, Oh, this is terrible. Oh, I want to bring him back. I want to, I want people to see his Shakespearean work, you know, and see books, a whole thing for him to do Shakespeare. And it turns out he's really bad. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> right. And so it's like to be, uh, you, you have to be a really good actor to, to act, as a bad actor. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> yeah. Right. 
Yeah. It's like on SNL when they have these singers and they want them to sing badly. Right. You know, and they have to figure out how to do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, when it gets into all of this about making Roma Republic and uh, all that, I'm like, I, whether or not this is accurate or, I, you know, falls in some sort of timeline that makes any sort of sense with this film, I have absolutely no idea. Well, it does. It, yeah, I, I think I think in terms of what was actually going on in Rome at the time, it, it's probably yeah, it, it's it's a big stretch. But it does speak to something in my. I mean, Rome started out as a republic, right? Mm-hmm. And and it just sort of fell to this this uh, autocracy, and 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 it it Rome sort of stumbled along for another however many years, right? And I was thinking about how like the people who are in the empire that's falling, do they know like mm. our time is over now? You know? Right. Like, like Rome would never become a Republic. The Roman empire would never become a Republic again. Right. So d- did they, you know what I mean? Like you, you, when you're in it, you're like, Oh no, this is power to the people or whatever. And mm-hmm. it's like, no, not so much. <laughs> right. That's the thing that I've always felt like, this isn't exactly the example, but when, when people do biopics, mm-hmm. right. And then we've talked about this and then you need antagonists. Right. So sometimes they'll pick people, the writers will pick people who actually existed, but change them a little bit. Yeah. So they're more antagonistic toward our, our protagonist. And then it works because then we see our protagonist overcome it. And we're like, Hey, good for you. You didn't listen to all the people who said you, you'd never make it or tried to get in there in your way. And mm-hmm. then you read the the true story afterwards. And it turns out, well, no, that guy was his biggest champion. You yeah, know, he yeah. was, <laughs> that's right. So I, I just feel like it'd be so hard to, to, to twist the facts like this. I'd have a hard time with it. Yeah. And, and I, I feel just like, again, I, I understand the, the dramatic urge to, you know, you want to tell, um, you want to tell, a story that's as compelling as possible, but yeah, I, 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 I bristle at sort of be, being, being lackadaisical about, about what fa- just factual truths, like things that happen and be like, Nope, actually in our story, it didn't happen. You know? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Right. It feels very audacious when Tarantino does it, you know, you brought up in glorious bastards. It's like, what if, uh, what if they, they did kill Hitler, right. you know, or what if the Manson people, uh, didn't get to Sharon Tate, but the, some washed up actor, <laughs> you know, and his friend killed them instead, <laughs> yeah, right. you know? And door. yeah. And it feels like, well, that's crazy. You know, we kind of laugh at it like comedies, but then these movies with older history that we may not know as well, <laughs> we're like, Oh, so that's what happened. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Well, I, I always use this example, you know, one, one of my assignments uh, in, in my classes is I say, watch a movie based on, uh, you know, based on true events, ostensibly true events, and then do a compare and contrast. How well does the movie, you know, match up with history? And and my nephew happened to take this class and, and uh, he, he did Braveheart at the suggestion of, of his of his dad, my brother. And I was like, so what, what do you think of Braveheart? And he just with this disgusted look, he goes, the Battle of Sterling Bridge doesn't even take place on a bridge. <laughs> yeah <laughs> it always cracks me up <laughs> it's kind of funny it's like almost like holding up a history book and be like you know i just read this really interesting story but you know i think it would be cooler <laughs> like, yeah exactly <laughs> <laughs> what if they were robots um <laughs> I remember telling my brother that about, about, about his kid. And he's just like, he just ruins everything. Doesn't he? <laughs> <laughs> That's really funny. <laughs> and we have this whole conversation here about how, uh, you know, Commodus is going to win over the people with these games. And, uh, I, I saw that there was a deleted scene that I thought was kind of interesting where they get more into the fact that took like, uh, pay for these games. They're having to <laughs> like mess up their economy basically. Right. And it's like damaging the city. I mean, you can see why they didn't need to keep it, but it's yeah, just, like, I think it's interesting. It's, it's good texture, but, but the movie's already quite long. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Right. Yeah. 
it's just weird too. Oh, you know, another thing I was reading where they were saying though, something that was true, but that they didn't think audiences would accept it is that these gladiators actually did product placement. That's <laughs> that was so that was really funny when I read about that. Yeah. Right? Yeah, they would do advertisements for something. Like, sort like of olive things. oil and stuff, you know? Yeah, yeah. And so that was in the original script, and it's historically accurate, but they left it out because people would be like, that's not believable, even though that is something that happened. Yeah, it feels like it would be meta or something. It's it's like a Zucker Brothers movie or something. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, the the... The way gladiators, successful gladiators were treated, I mean, they were, you know, they were treated very well in between matches, right? Because it was like having a, like a prize horse. Right. And that's something the movie doesn't get into too much. But I mean, it, what, somebody who had built up a level of success such as the Spaniard, right, would have been uh, very well taken care of. Mm-hmm. It's so, it's, it's so, it's barbaric, obviously. No, I'm glad that you said like a prized horse. Cause I was going to say like a, like a sports hero, but that's sure. not, that's not true. It is no. more than a prized horse kept in yeah. a, in a, you know, stable. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Basically. Yeah. Right. And like, uh, and the movie alludes to this, you know, like, uh, w- women, you know, would pay money to be able to, you know, spend time with, um, the prize horses, so to speak, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Are you not entertained, Brian? They certainly are. Yeah. He's won them over. You know, it's in my experience, uh, once you, once you win over the mob, uh, <laughs> you know, you're, you're in good shape. <laughs> that's, that's been my experience in my life. That's funny. In your life. <laughs> um you know what's funny by the way just a little personal anecdote i was starting this movie last night and uh, let's see i watched it on the uh, paramount plus app okay and i was noticing how much grain there was which i was like oh wow i usually uh they kind of when movies are restored they kind of take a lot of that out Sure, but I thought sure. it was kind of cool. I was like, oh, this looks probably how it looked in the year 2000. This is great. But yeah. for some reason, the app was faltering and it was stuttering and skipping. It was acting very weird. And I was like, I can't watch the whole movie this way. So I went over to Showtime and uh, like Showtime on demand. Mm-hmm. And it was totally different. Clearly the latest restoration, the grain was gone. I was like, wow. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and the one we're watching is is... I don't, I don't see any grain. No. Yeah. It's pretty. So it was kind of interesting. Then I almost accidentally got a side by side comparison of what it probably actually looks like on the film. You know, if you were to scan the, the film image and that's what it looks like, there's, that's the grain that's present and what modern restoration 4k restoration looks like for a movie from the year 2000. So that's really something. And I could kind of decide how I felt about it. And I, I got to say, I mean, there was part of me that thought, oh, wow, they really, I mean, they altered the image. That's weird. I feel weird about that. And at the same time, I don't think they made it look bad. You know, I, it doesn't have that waxy look that we talk about. It's tricky. It's tricky sometimes. Yeah. Well, you know, we brought up True Lies and, yeah. well, a lot of the Cameron films, but especially True Lies, just maybe they went a little too far, a little overboard with it. And it, the faces don't look like human faces. They look like wax right. figures. But I, I thought they actually did a pretty good job on this. I mean, you can see the creases on the faces and textures I, on the clothes. I agree so, with you. Yeah. You know, if they're going to do it at all, I feel like it hasn't ruined the integrity of the image. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The The music in this sequence, by the way, is really terrific. It's a, This whole soundtrack is just, I mean, it, it's one of Hans Zimmer's great, great scores. Definitely. Well, you just saw it uh, performed live recently, right? Yeah, which is just bananas, man. The crowd went went nuts for for the the gladiator portion of the program. Yeah, um, and he actually, you know, because he didn't come back to do the score for the second one, and and he said that he's done sequels before, but for him, Gladiator is a very special score for him, and hmm. he didn't want to try to compete with himself. Interesting. Yeah. 
and it kind of bums me out if I'm being honest. Like I, I'm sure Harry Gregson Williams will do fine, but it won't be the Hans Zimmer score. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. I, I feel like his music is is an essential part of the continuing appeal of this movie. I agree. Definitely. Mm-hmm. I mean, you could argue it's uh, another character in the film. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. <laughs> That's what everybody else so, says about New York. You could always argue, or you could argue that uh, New York is itself a character in the, in the film. <laughs> so Russell Crowe is today about the same age Oliver Reed was in this movie. Oh, wow. Right. So they, they missed this. Like if Maximus had been uh, alive at the end, you know, he, he would have been the, the Proximo character in the new one, you know? Right. Right. Hmm. Wow. That's so weird. It's weird to think in that way, right? Like, yeah. I remember watching this movie a couple of years back and having this realization. I was like, oh, wait, this is this is a movie about Superman's dad teaming up with with the Wonder Woman's mom and the wizard Shazam to defeat the Joker. <laughs> That's really funny to defeat the Joker. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or should I say a Joker since. Uh... <laughs> yeah, there you go. Spoiler. <laughs> <laughs> That's really funny. You know, it's you're uh, sorry. I'm I'm talking so much about visuals here, but the uh, I saw something on I don't know Instagram or Reddit or something, and they were showing a comparison of images from the first Gladiator and the new Gladiator, and they were saying mm-hmm. I, I'm thinking of it because of the scene here where Maximus is talking to Juba, mm-hmm. but there's like a harsh light, yeah, you know, the actual sun beating on them, and you can see this harsh light, yeah, haloing them a little bit. But they were showing an image from the new one, and they put diffusions out to sort of okay. blunt the sun. So there's a more of an even looking lighting across everybody, even though they're supposed to be in the sun in the arena. And they were saying it just doesn't have that same naturalistic oomph hmm. you know, in the first one. And I just thought that was interesting. I don't know if that's something I would have even clocked, but when you know it and you look at it, it does feel different. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm going to have to, it'll, I mean, I haven't paid particular attention to the trailer, so it's definitely something I'll be I'll be paying attention for when I when I watch the movie. Yeah. So this was kind of cool. Actually, uh, I was in Rome uh, a year ago and got to see the Colosseum. Wow! And so it was kind of cool, like seeing. I mean, I, I I think most of this is a recreation, but it, it resembled. Yeah. Uh. A lot of what I saw, and what I what I liked too was I guess they built a third of it, right? And then they filled in the rest with uh, visual effects, mm-hmm. which I think to great effect. Yeah, I agree. But uh, I guess when what they wanted to do, how they wanted to present it in the film, was presented to Ridley Scott, he was like, "Well, it's so small. It's I, I actually thought it'd be bigger." Mm-hmm. And he said, "Well, let's let's make it the the Coliseum of our imaginations." Interesting. Like the way we, we think of it in our minds versus what uh-huh. it actually is in scale. And I thought, <laughs> I like that. Because that's probably, I mean, from the character's point of view, that's how it felt. Right. You know? Going from where they were fighting, stepping into Rome and seeing this huge, you know, arena. Right. This is so creepy. He's such a weirdo. Commodus. <laughs> I know. Man, you just want to see him get his ass kicked. I know. Look at the, the the lights that are sort of dancing around too, though. You got all these cloths. You got these. You know, see, look at like a over the bed. These moving yep. shadows. I mean, that's yeah, a, that's stuff Ridley Scott thinks of. That's why Blade Runner's Blade Runner. You know. Yeah, that's right. Just so many details and just visual flourishes that just make the room so alive. Yeah, it, it's again when when we look at the the sort of the the sword and sandal movies that spring up in the wake of Gladiator's success, you can see why 
none of them really enjoyed the level of, of success that, that this one experienced. Mm. Um, because it, it feels very mercenary. Like, okay, Hey, people mm. like gladiator. What, what do we have? Like gladiator, you know? Yeah, sure. And, and not, you know, I, I use Troy as an example all the time where I'm like, I think it's well-made, it's well-acted, immaculate production design, all of it works, but you're trying to turn a fantasy story into like a semi-historical epic a la Gladiator. Mm. And it just, you know, it's a story about uh, gods and monsters and you take all of that stuff out. Well, it's a different thing then, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. And then, of course, uh, uh, Kingdom of Heaven, I think, uh, which, again, I really like it. But, uh, you know, what's his name? Uh, uh, Legolas is not, what the hell's his name? Orlando Bloom. <laughs> Orlando Bloom. <It's> just, <laughs> he, he doesn't have the, the you know, the... the Gravitas? Not, the gravitas, right? Like, he, 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 had, he, was, too, he was too green, to play mm. that character. You know, I think with, sure. with Maximus, you, you believe that he's got some years uh, behind him, you know? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And there's like a brutishness to him. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I've not seen uh, kingdom of heaven. I need to watch that. I mean, I highly recommend it. Watch the, the, the extended edition. I mean, it is a legitimately, I think it's a great movie. Mm-hmm. Um, but but it's easy, it's not surprising to me that it didn't find an audience, you know. Sure. <laughs> the ladies love the gladiators. Yeah. She pops up again later. I remember seeing her, and I was like, "Oh, I wonder if they filmed that on the same day, or if that was unintentional right. that it's her again." So worth noting as a historical fact that that Marcus Aurelius did not, in fact, ban the games in Rome. I think they were only banned in a, in a one province, hmm. but they were never banned in Rome. So interesting. It was very funny, uh, visiting the Colosseum and just seeing, you know, they actually have ancient graffiti preserved hmm. that people had made there. And you just, you know, I don't know. You just think, I always think of the past, like, Oh, they, They were so different than us, you know, in so many ways you think, but not really, (laughs) you know, there's still rascals scrawling stupid things on the wall for for a good time. Call. Yeah. X. (laughs) Yeah. X V M M. Yeah. (laughs) No, that makes no sense because they wouldn't have a phone, but (laughs) (laughs) kind of makes it even funnier. Yeah. X V M I I. Yeah. 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 But it was kind of haunting too. I mean, you think about all the atrocities that took place there, you know. Well, this is this is the thing, right? Like like the I don't know if if this stuff is romanticized, but it's 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 horrific. Yeah, you know, people gathered to watch people die horribly. Mhm. And that was mm-hmm. just sort of an accepted part of of everyday life back then. And I think about like what what are the things that people look back on our time to be like, I can't believe they did that, you know? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. This is a good scene. You know, you see Man. Maximus the dad here. That's right, yeah. Right? It's like a very dad thing, you know. The boy like, <laughs> I hear you can crush a, a man's skull. Like, not a man's skull, boy's skull. You know, it's like a <laughs> playful dad sort of silliness. Well, uh, I, I mean, neither of us has seen the new one, but apparently, l- literally, his dad... At least based on the the what what's revealed in the trailers. For the oh movie. yeah, yeah. Which seems like horseshit to me, but I guess we'll 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 get. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. Yeah, yeah. This is good. I mean, I love this too. That what what huh? what? what? Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm ducking away here. This has done so well. I was looking at this scene last night. Him in the uh, I don't know what you'd call it the quarters with all the warriors down there. And I was like, man, that must've stunk. <laughs> yeah, it's true. You know, it's you think sweat. about it. Yeah. No, no deodorant. Yeah. They don't have toilet paper, you know, like who knows, Ugh. man, can you imagine just B.O. I'm mean, right. And when's the last time those clothes were washed? <laughs> Dude. Good God. I was, I was thinking about this scene. I remember, it's funny because the same thought returned to me as I was watching the same scene today. 
That is really funny. See, it's funny too, this mask that he's putting on now. I, I saw, <laughs> I saw um, at uh, Regal at least, you know, they have all the popcorn buckets and special cups now, and they had a cup with that mask on. Really? And it's funny because there's part of me that's like, yeah, that's pretty cool. But then I also think of like history and I'm like, yeah, men died wearing that, you know, <laughs> probably against their will. <laughs> But, you know, and that's the thing. I mean, you can take the movie however you want. You can revel in the violence of it. But I do think the movie itself is always has me on the side of it's all about survival instead of, you know, licking our lips at the... Well, sure, but it kind of wants to have it both ways, too. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's riveting and it's scary, yeah. you know, but I, I do... I think this right here, by the way, this is, this oh, is yeah. a, a, a real set with a digital extender at the top. Incredible. It looks yeah. so good. Yeah. And then, I mean, what a, what an amazing shot there, right? That sort of little yeah. fisheye kind of effect going on there. Just the dizzying, holy crap, we're, you know, we're fighting in these little arenas, you know, out in the, the rural areas. And then now yeah. it's like, where the heck are we? What is this? All these people here to watch us fight or die. Yeah. Uh, well, probably more, more of the latter. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, really, like you really want to think about it. Like, yeah. Can you imagine being in that situation forced out there? Like everyone's cheering, like as you're dying, Yeah, everyone's cheering. That's why they're there. You know, like you're almost like you're not a human being. That's, that's, that's deep. <laughs> See, I'm juxtaposing what we're watching now with like Mike Tyson fighting Jake Paul, and I'm trying to find some some broader social commentary. I don't know. I don't know. You know, I mean, well, there's a lot of things you could apply to that fight specifically. I mean, I've always found boxing pretty brutal. Yeah. And it's sometimes amazed I'm amazed that it's actually a sport. Yeah. Even though I admit that I've watched it from time to time. Sure. But to your point, I think with that fight specifically, I think everyone tuned in because they wanted to see Logan Paul die. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> like Jake that's what Paul. I watched. Or Jake Paul, sorry. <laughs> hey, what the hell? <laughs> yeah, either one, throw him in the ring. No, but I that's why I watched. I wanted to see this little shit <laughs> get his ass kicked. That's why I tuned in. And it didn't happen, and I was disappointed. So I you mean You should realize, Brian, this is not the year for for having hope for <laughs> injustice and yeah <laughs> i mean it is funny because he he won the fight and i'm like okay what's he gonna do next shove dick van dyke down some stairs like what you know <laughs> <laughs> right. yeah okay you beat a 60 year old man congratulations you know i know i know <laughs> but what i mean to your point i mean it's not murder per se but i did right. tune in to watch some hoping for some brutality you know so, oh, yeah at least a bloody nose in there somewhere yeah it's still it's still in us and you're complicit and you're, and I'm talking to the audience now and you're all <laughs> complicit too. <laughs> now this action sequence, I love it. It's so well staged the way the music kicks in. Uh, and I love that Zimmer brings in the same, uh, you know, heroic theme from, from the battle in the beginning, you know, which mm. is sort of, this is Maximus, the, the, the general, you know, taking over, you mm -hmm. know, mm-hmm. Now, and I love, he, say, he says, before they go out, he's like, has any of you been in the military? And one of them's like, I served with you. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, at least one person knows who he is. Right. Yeah, I like that. Now, now, who are these people, you know, who are being let in to fight these gladiators? Like, what's their deal? I mean, did I, are they forced into this also? I assumed that they're the reigning champions. Mm, I see. But they're reenacting some kind of a battle, like the Battle of Carthage or something. Right, right. This is great. I love this. Like building the the wall. Yeah. With their uh, shields. and It's funny. I had forgotten that whole thing uh, sticking out of the hubcap there. I couldn't remember yeah. if it was a blade or just something blunt to knock them over. And then when that woman gets sliced in half. I yeah. Like, oh, like, oh, oh okay. blade. So, so blade. Got it. <laughs> it's a blade. <laughs> You know, watching this sequence, I, I got to say, I, I don't think I would do well as a gladiator. <laughs> That's my, no, nope. I'm going to take that, take that leap. 
Yeah, yeah, I do not know what I would do. <laughs> oh, I'd be the guy pissing himself. I know that. Oh, definitely. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know. I'd probably be like the guy like trying to take a helmet off of one of the, like the gold <laughs> helmet off and putting it on and pretending I'm one of them or something. <laughs> I feel like that's what I would try to do. <laughs> There's no instant replay. <laughs> they might lose track of me. <laughs> it's so funny. Now, now, Commodus, the real Commodus, was like a a, a nut about the, the Gladiator games, right? Right, and and he would fight himself, but they would be rigged games. Yeah, yeah, I saw that. I guess he he fought almost seven hundred times. Yeah, um, but he would give them wooden weapons, and he'd use real weapons and all. Sorts yeah, so of... he it was like WWE style. It was just kayfabe when he was doing it. Hmm. And and people lost interest because they're like, oh, this this shit is just rigged. Yep. Yep. Yeah. But how messed up, right? Like he comes in to the ring to fight and you're like, well, great. <laughs> we all right. know how this yeah. is going. <laughs> That's right. You know? <laughs> yeah. And apparently if they even like, you know, caused him any harm, then they'd just be tortured and killed. And Wow. Yeah. Let's see. Oh, yeah. He was the only Roman emperor in history to fight as a gladiator in the arena. Which, again, that would mean something if it wasn't just just play acting, you know, cosplay, Mm -hmm. basically. Yeah, exactly. It's like, don't you got don't you have other stuff to do? You know, like he he didn't care about about governing. Right. He wanted to be uh, hero worshipped. Yeah, exactly. And it's interesting because because the general perception of Marcus Aurelius is that he was he was a good uh, good emperor. Right. And you know, he's known as a philosopher and everything. And it's you know, he kind of got had this piece of shit as a son who was like one of the worst emperors. Right. You just never know, Brian. I guess that's the point. Yeah, you don't. You do not know. <laughs> oh man. I don't know. I just, I feel like this movie does a good job. Really. uh, We were talking about it earlier. I mean, where we see Maximus pull off killing like five of his executioners at once, but they still kind of keep it on the ground. Like they make it seem somewhat plausible, at least in its execution. He's not making these like matrix leaps over horses and doing sorts (laughs) of things. Right. And I feel like that's what makes even like scenes like this play so well too. There's not these sort of crazy, you know, chariots working in a way that they don't work in real life. And it, it feels sloppy and it feels messy and, and violent. But when they survive, there's like a real relief to it. You know, we feel like we've been through something. Well, I think it helps that, you know, we don't have big sequences where people turn into, to, uh, CGI stuntmen. You know? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. That's what I mean. I, I just, I like that. And I, I'm curious how the, the sequel will handle it. Cause you know, yeah. and there's certain movies where that's fine to take those artistic liberties because of whatever reality they're creating. But in this reality, I want it all to feel super real. So I am gripping my seat watching these people fight for their lives. You know what yeah. I mean? Like I want to yeah. see and feeling that relief when they survive yeah. versus, Oh, I'm just watching some, choreographed kind of thing. Oh, this mm-hmm. looks like the same choreographer as all the Marvel movies, you know, like the, all yeah. the same sort of leaps and twists and whatever. And we're like, we're like picking on the Marvel movies and, and we always say, it's like, well, those movies are doing what they do, but it's, it's, it becomes a problem when everything is trying to do that. And when everything's trying to do that. And when everything starts to feel the same, I, yes. I, that's why I'm looking forward to this next wave of Marvel films, because I think they look a little different and I'm hoping yeah. they sort of shake up the choreography and whatnot. Fingers crossed. Yeah. So this scene right here is, it's, you know, if if you're the audience member, this is the scene you've been waiting for. Mm-hmm. You know, it, like it's it's you want to you want to see. You know what it's like? It's it's like in 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 Rebel Ridge when when Don Johnson finds out who who um uh, you know what's his name Aaron Pierre like who he actually is, you know? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And it's like, we as the audience, like, no, oh man, this guy is about to get his ass kicked. <laughs> right, right, right. Right. And, and you know, this moment, like it is iconic right here. Mm-hmm. He takes his helmet off, you know, man, what a, what a, I remember like just sitting in the theater opening night and just like leaning forward in my seat. Yep. My name is Maximus Desmond. 
face. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Husband to a murdered wife. Yeah. Father to a murdered son. What an incredible line, too. And I'll have my vengeance in this life or the next. And what's funny is Russell Crowe didn't want to say that. Yep, that's the line. He thought it, he, he thought it sounded stupid. Yep. And boy, if he thought he was stupid, he sure sells the hell out of it. You know, I mean, that's a fist pump moment. Yeah. <laughs> Phoenix is so good. I would, I think he should have. I don't know who he lost to for the Oscar, but I I could completely see him winning it for this. Who won that year? Let's see. Um, so I know he was nominated. He was nominated, and by the way, actor best actor nominees that year alongside Russell Crowe, Javier Bardem for Before Night Falls, Tom Hanks for Castaway, mm. uh, Ed Harris for Pollock, and Jeffrey Rush for Quills. Mm. I haven't seen some of those, but I mean, Tom Hanks was pretty incredible in Castaway. Yeah, I, I would say if it was a contest, it was between those two. Yeah. Um, but actor in a supporting role, the winner, well, here are the nominees, uh, Albert Finney for Aaron Rockovich. Okay. Uh, Willem Dafoe for Shadow of the Empire, Jeff Bridges for The Contender, and Benicio Del Toro for Traffic. Hmm. And Benicio won it. Okay. Okay. And he's and he's good in that movie, so yeah. I, I can't I can't quibble with that. Yeah. <laughs> so many memorable things from this. The thumbs up. Yep. <laughs> Quintus, you son of a bitch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I was reading that I mean some of these people, obviously there's some actors in the stands, but then they filled in, you know, some digital people, some cardboard, you know, standee kind of situations. Yep. But it all looks great. Yeah. Makes me think of uh a year earlier, Phantom Menace when they had the pod racing and they had that sort of arena and all the people in there. Yeah. And it was, uh, um, like Q it, it was a combination of digital and like miniatures, right? Yeah. Yeah. I saw something where it, like part of it was painted Q tips. That's right. That's right. Okay. Pretty amazing. <laughs> he's just that guy. <laughs> Wherever he goes, he's going to win him over. <laughs> um, you know, I was reading somewhere when this movie was presented to Ridley Scott. Uh, they didn't even give him a script, right? They showed him a painting. Like that, Well, I think I, I think it was in addition to the script that they showed him the painting. Okay, and they were like, "Well, oh, okay." So they had something that was at least finished or put together at that point. Yeah. And well, it, no, it, it wasn't even a, it, it wasn't like concept art. It was like a famous painting. No, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. It's from, I think it's called Police Verso. Yes, that's right. That's, that's yeah. Yeah. Showing like the, the excesses of Rome during this era. Yeah. There's like a gladiator standing over a, you know, defeated opponent or whatever. Yes. And the people cheering in the stands. I think there's even a thumbs up, thumbs down situation happening with people in the audience. And based on that painting, Scott was like, I'll do it. And it is, I mean, it's, it, this is, it, th you know, the, the producers were like, oh, this is, we got to go to Ridley Scott with this. And I find that interesting too, because it, you know, his filmography was so diverse even then that it's, it's hard for me to see what automatically pointed towards him as the right fit for this. I mean, he ended up being the right fit, of course, but you know what I mean? That's a really good point because it seems so obvious now because we've seen the proof of concept, but yeah, exactly. Yeah. No, that's a, that's a real good point. I mean, speaking to the movies he had just done. Thelma and Louise, right? White Squall, those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hmm. I, mean, I don't 4, know. 1492 isn't exactly like, <laughs> like, oh, hey, give that guy a Gladiator movie. Yeah, that's interesting. I don't know. What's, oh, we just missed it. Uh, I think, what's that line where he's like, I'm vexed. I am vexed. I'm terribly vexed. Terribly yeah. vexed. <laughs> oh, th this vexes me. This vexes me. Yeah, I'm terribly vexed. <laughs> we got to bring that back into the vernacular. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. It just kind of amazes me, you know, when you watch a film that has not just one memorable scene, not just a handful of memorable lines, but just throughout, 
yeah. so many things have stuck. They resonated right. and stuck. I mean, that's just really doesn't happen often. Yeah. Well, let me ask you. So, so did you, when did you see this? I saw it in theaters. This was a movie I very much remember seeing when it opened and it was basically sold out and I had to sit front row. I'll never forget okay. <laughs> looking up at this movie <laughs> the first wow. time I saw it. Then I remember watching it on DVD. Mm -hmm. Then I think I watched it uh, like maybe 10 years ago or so. And then okay. last night. Oh, wow, okay. So, so did you go opening night? I don't know if it was opening night, but I'm sure it was pretty close. Yeah. Cause I, yeah, I remember very distinctly opening night. I, w I went with, with Paul Shirey and Sean Coyle and, um, our friend Barb mm -hmm. and, and, and again, it was opening night. It's so funny. I, what I remember is uh, that was the same night that the final episode of Boy Meets World aired. <laughs> wow. And I had forgotten to set my, my timer to record it. This is the VHS days, right? Well, yeah. And you can't uh, watch it anywhere else. It's, yeah, you have exactly. to wait for a rerun now. <laughs> now it's like I pull out my phone. I go to YouTube TV, just hit plus, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I had to call up my cousin. I was like, "Hey, record it for me," you know, and then and then we watched it. We we went to the AMC in in Warrenville, mm -hmm. and and man, that joint was packed. And you talk about the perfect audience to be able to watch this movie with, you know, mm -hmm. the opening night crowd. And it was it was a transporting experience because it it for me at least it was the first time seeing kind of these these big scale epics like this on the big screen, you know. Yeah, that's a good point. I don't know what i would have seen before this like that i mean i missed braveheart in theaters i didn't see that in the theaters, i think so. same yeah i might have been too young yeah. although i will say that is a movie i think i've seen more than this that's interesting that was a big movie on vhs or even in college i remember right. that was like one of those movies where if like someone was watching it in a dorm room and you passed you just kind of joined <laughs> <laughs> like it was just like a weird sort of siren song for <laughs> men especially in that era I don't yeah know yeah i'm i'm curious like how, how that movie is thought of now like if it's held up you know i do I, that's one i've not seen in a long time i don't yeah, know same very curious I mean, this this summer, the same summer this came out, uh, about about two months later, was the Patriot with Mel Gibson. Yeah. Okay. Okay. You know, so he he chose to do that in in lieu of this. Interesting. It is funny though. He does seem, in my memory, older in that movie than Russell Crowe does here, like notably. Yeah. You know, like he seems like he could be the dad to the Heath Ledger or whoever. Right. You know. Yeah, and he's like 43, you know? Yeah, yeah. So weird. Russell Crowe is like 35 here, I think. Hmm. You know, it's a, a moment I, I we sort of talked over earlier, though, but when he was talking to uh, Lucilla, 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 is that yeah. what you said? Uh, mm -hmm. Earlier, and she mentions her son, and he says, Oh, she says her son is eight. And he goes, I have a yep. boy who's eight. The way he yep. lights up, it's like this heavy conversation. But when he gets to speak about his son, the way he, like his face lightens up, I just love it. I, I do like that. However, the thought I had was, so were you like screwing Lucilla at the exact same time you were screwing your wife? <laughs> Touche. Right. And again, we say this with no knowledge of, of the actual, maybe there's some, you know, in story explanation that makes it more sense. Mm -hmm. But I don't know, Brian. Don't know. Don't know. This is a funny beat. I like this. Yeah, this is good. They <laughs> they wonder if his food is poison. It's very funny. This is something you could cut. Right. right. Yeah. But it, it adds to the life outside of the arena with these men. Yeah. You know, sort well, of a great moment kind of, and they laugh. <laughs> and just the bond between these three, I think. Yeah, yeah. And that the fact yeah, the fact the guy's willing to try his food to test it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's good. <laughs> and then he dies. That'd be funny. He has a good yeah, laugh. Yeah, it's like a delayed delayed reaction. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I know. Poison doesn't hit that quickly. Come on. <laughs> that is funny though, now that I think about it. Wasn't that I feel like I was trying to read about all the history and uh, I think Commodus wasn't killed in an arena. 
right. think he was poisoned and I think he threw up the poison. And so then they like stabbed him to death. <laughs> no, his, his trainer strangled him. Oh, sorry. Bed. Yes. Wait, who was I reading that about? That was someone else. Oh, there's then. so many. Yeah, yeah, actually, then it was someone else. No, you're right. Because it was a, a, a wrestler, right? Yeah, his trainer yes. named Narcissus. N- Narcissus, yeah. Narcissus. And Which that I, was going I, to be Maximus's name in this. They were going to make him oh. that guy originally. Okay. So we missed out on the the, the final uh, throwdown in Commodus's bath. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> They're like throwing uh, water at each other, you know, like (laughs) in the tub or whatever. Yeah. What's that movie with uh, Viggo Mortensen where it's like Eastern Promises or something where they have that naked fight in a a bad house? Yeah, Eastern Eastern Promises. Yeah. Yeah, it'd be like that. Exactly. (laughs) And and, and that would have won Best Picture. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Here's our guy. Yeah, he, he Tommy Flanagan has that distinctive scar, right? Yeah, and yeah, in in Braveheart, he's the he's the person whose uh, wife gets taken, right? Oh man, I it's been a minute. The you know the prima nocta scene. Yeah, no, I do. I so mean, I, I remember the moment, but I'm pretty I, sure he's the husband. Yeah. And I always feel like going back to movies like this, feeling like they'd be exhausting to make. I mean, when you have like horses mm-hmm. and chariots and animals and all sorts of things, they need to do what you want them to do and then cut, reset, start over. Yeah. Ugh, I feel so exhausting I mean, to me. just sitting on our ass for four hours while they were doing that with a sitcom. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> right. So this scene right here, as, the, as so, so Oliver Reed, you know, uh, keels over and he's now, now this is a problem because Proximo is too important to just disappear from the story. So they went back and they, they combed every piece of footage they could find. And that bit right there where he's looking up, mm. if he went a little bit longer. He says, shadows and dust. Mm. And so he says, shadows and dust. And he looks up. Shadows and dust like that. And so they just took that little end right there and they found a way to make that Proximo's final line. Mm -hmm. And it's so poetic and it's so perfect. Mm -hmm. And it was born of pure necessity. So when you watch the scene later, Proximo's dead scene, it is that, that shot, that exact shot that we just saw of him. Wow. Like they, it seems like here they cut it. Yeah. Within a frame of what they yep. were going to use at the end. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Amazing. And they, and they, more than just that, I mean, that whole bit where Proximo comes and gives him the keys and, and Maximus is like, Proximo, are you in danger of becoming a good man? And he's like, huh. It was all just, they pulled whatever they could find. Oh, wow. None of that. Oliver Reed didn't film any of that. None of that was in the script. That was he created just to be able to write out his character. Wow. Amazing, huh. right? Yeah. I didn't know that about that scene. Yeah. <laughs> this is pretty crazy. So, I mean, you it's easy for you. Now, you would just write, hey, uh, there's tigers and rhinoceroses and sharks in the <laughs> arena. And you go, okay, how much is that going to cost me? <laughs> you know, we, we can do That's it. Right. But, you know, in 2000, it's like, all right, there's tigers leaping toward Russell Crowe. How do you do that? Right. <laughs> I think they do a good job. I mean, it's, uh, I think they push it to the limit of whatever they were able to capture and edit coherently. Right. But I do feel like it plays pretty well. Sometimes like going back to the movie top gun in 1986 or whatever it is, it does feel like a lot of those aerial fights. It's mm-hmm. just a bunch of footage they got and they tried to cut it in such a way that it looks like it's making some sort of sense. <laughs> You yeah, know what I mean? yeah, it's just kind of yeah. yeah if airplane goes right, airplane goes left, you know, kind of a thing. <laughs> That's right. But here, I do feel like they they got some good stuff with these tigers, and it does make it look like they're actually a part of the action. But you do see a lot of quick cutting where it's like that's probably all they had of it looking ferocious. That's right. Yeah, and so you know what I mean. Yeah, this is this is not uh, Life of Pi where you can just uh, <laughs> right, right, yeah, right, just just c- contrive it out of a whole cloth. Yeah. But it's really impressive. Oh, I yeah. Considering when it was made, absolutely. Yeah. 
I was reading somewhere that they were having problems because the Tigers were being really docile. Okay. And so they were like going so far as to even put things on their faces to like bare their teeth, like pull sort of these invisible sorts of, I don't know, bands or something across yeah. their mouth so their teeth wow. would show. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, if, if your tiger is docile, call it a win. Yeah, yeah, I know. Like, don't make them mad, you know? I know. I think that all the time, especially when you see dogs or wolves in movies and they are mm-hmm. baring their teeth and growling, they don't know yeah. they're in a movie. You know, <laughs> like that right, would make me nervous if I was an actor right, there right. and the animals behaving that way. <laughs> oh, Commodus. Will you ever when win? When will you ever learn? <laughs> so this actor who plays uh, Tigress of Gaul, he's uh, Sven Oli Thorson. He's like any of these like sand and uh, uh, sword and sandal type movies. He's he's in Conan the Barbarian. He's in Thirteenth Warrior. You know, hmm. he's he used to be on a show called Captain Power in the late eighties. What's that? It was like a sci-fi show for for kids. It was, there was a toy line where like. You had this jet that would shoot at the TV. I was going to say, that sounds really familiar. I thought it was. Yeah. Captain Power and the Soldiers of the Future. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Huh. Now this is, this is the scene. And I know, I know this is a Brian Hall scene. Where <laughs> right. He's about to kill the guy, but he's like, no, I'm not doing it. And I know, mm-hmm. I know this is the type of thing that, 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 uh, that lights your fire. It does. It always does. <laughs> <laughs> Mercy. Mercy is the most c- courageous act. There you go. Yeah. Put that up, put that on the poster. <laughs> Actually don't, because people wouldn't show up to watch it. Yeah, yeah. Or or then you could add until it wasn't dot 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 or something. <laughs> yeah, it's I mean it's like remember in Mad Max uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Beyond Thunderdome, right? He fights uh you know, Master Blaster, you know, and then mm-hmm. He defeats him, and he has a chance to kill him, but he doesn't. Like you always have that scene. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Because it proves the the type of person your hero is. Yeah. So this was the fight that was supposed to be rigged. That's right. That that costume looks really hot. What what Joaquin Phoenix is wearing? Yeah, I would be uncomfortable in that. I have a feeling. You know, I was thinking a lot about hairstyles and things. There's a guy who has kind of a buzz cut, mm-hmm. and I was like, how would they do that back then? But maybe yeah, I'm being they, ignorant. They, you know, they like, used you know. a, a knife or something. Yeah, but doesn't that sound terrible? See that guy on the left there? Um, <laughs> That's hilarious. I'm sure they had. <laughs> Some sort of clipping technology. I, I picture like a like a Flintstones type thing where you know you've got like a lizard that you run around <laughs> and it's like it's a living or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, that's, that's how the Romans did it, right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> Everything was like a, a talking animal. You know? Yeah. <laughs> no, but this is the stuff when you do a revenge movie. You have to have the villain say something like this, you know, your son squealed when he died and you're right, wife, you know, but it's like, it never fails to just make this fire in the pit of me, this anger yeah. and this hatred toward that character. Like, it's just so despicable and, you know, it's always so effective. Yeah. You know, it's, it's like in, in the untouchables when, uh, you know, after Elliot Ness uh, gets Frank Nitty. And he's like, your friend died screaming like a pig, or, you know, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And he pushes him off the roof like you're supposed to do when somebody says that. That's right. That's what you're supposed to do. But that's why Maximus is so strong. That's true. Now is Maximus is better than Elliot Ness. <laughs> <laughs> or or uh, the Dark Knight, right? Where uh, the Joker's like, do you want to know which uh, one of ones of your friends were? Oh, yeah. Screamers or whatever. That's a good example. Yeah. But it's just so infuriating, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, it's just such a, and who knows if it's even true, but just there's that, uh, that process, that woman. Yeah. She really stands out. It's like the red and the black hair. 
They must have shot shot them out in the same day. Like, this seems like a sequence. They would have just done it all at once, right? Yeah. You got all your extras, you know? Yeah. Anyway, sorry, you were saying? No, 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 no. It's just, uh, it's just a good way to make you really hate a character. Mm-hmm. Yeah. See, the, those figurines, man. I mean, it's just, it, Russell Crowe picked it up as a way to just, just go through the scene. And it ends up being this very, this thing that connects the beginning to the end. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Sort of totem for him and for us. I mean, to yeah. to, to keep his family alive throughout the story, to remind us what right. it is that he's uh, existing for, their vengeance. Yeah, he he talked about how you know the 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 earlier scene where where Lucilla comes to see him that was supposed to culminate in a love scene between between Maximus and Lucilla, mm. and Crow was like, I mean, that doesn't make sense. Like you know, like mm-hmm. just given given what he's lost and what he's fighting for, the idea that you're just gonna in the middle of this revenge story be like, oh, but let's 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 snog for a little while, you know? I agree. I agree. <laughs> right? I think you, you would, that. You would like, lose well, him. Yeah, that sounds terrible, you know? Yeah. Think of Ridley Scott's wife, Russell. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> but yeah, we would lose lose track of what it is that he's he's enduring for. Right. But he really is such a whiny bitch, my God. <laughs> They're cheering for him. <laughs> I want to go to Tashi Station. <laughs> That's good. Oh, oh, I forgot. I had this uh, fact written down. I thought it was funny. So when they did have the tigers in the arena, mm-hmm. the safety measure was having, uh, well, they, they kept the actors about 15 feet away from the tigers at all times, but they had uh, a veterinarian there armed with tranquilizer darts. <laughs> wow. Okay. So it was just like, I don't know, man. Like, if I'm getting attacked, it's like first the guy has to aim, then he has to fire, then the dart has to. <laughs> sort of effect. Like it just feels like not the quickest uh, response yeah. I would want. There, but it there's a lot of pieces uh, that need to fit together. <laughs> yeah, no, it made me think of that Gentle Ben talk show on the Simpsons. <laughs> That's right, <laughs> with the bear with the talk show, and they're like no Ben, and then they pull out the tranquilizer guns, <laughs> and then it's just test patterns. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> So in terms of of other Russell Crowe teamings with with Ridley Scott, he did uh American Gangster. Oh uh, yeah. Right. And and um what was that what was that winemaking movie? You know what we're talking about? A Good Year, I think. I think it's called A Good Year, yeah. Yeah. And then he did uh, Robin Hood 10 years after this. You know, watching this made me want to rewatch that. Robin Hood? Mm-hmm. I haven't seen it since you and I saw it. Yeah, that was in the theater, right? Yeah. Yeah, I've kind of dipped in here and there, but yeah, I don't I don't remember very much about it. But I, I, I remember it being well made and Russell Crowe is fine. The cat, like everything's fine, but the movie just kind of, it didn't, it didn't catch, you know? That's my memory too. And I was wondering if, I don't know, I might look at it through a slightly different lens now, now that I know what yeah. it is. Right, right. And I mean, speaking, there is a, yeah. Uh, I was supposed to say there's an extended cut, which maybe, maybe improves it. I don't know. Wow. So all of his movies have an extended cut. <laughs> Feels like it. Yeah. Huh. I wonder what the story is behind that. Well, I think that in, in the, I was going to say in the DVD age, but I mean, geez, even Blade Runner, right? Blade Runner, Alien, they have extended cuts too. I know. I mean, Blade Runner makes the most sense, I feel. Right. Because that in was terms kind of, of yeah. massacred by the by the studio. Yeah. Yeah. And then maybe even Kingdom of Heaven, where it's like, I have my vision and it happens to be this length and the studio is like, no, but yeah. put out the theatrical version and then you can have whatever you want in the DVD age, you know, right. post whatever. But it, so many of his movies have those. I just wonder what the thinking is. If he's well, it's sure like the theatrical is for them and the, the extended cut is for him. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I, I guess he's at a place where he realizes like there's a way to get, you know, the, his preferred version out there mm-hmm. while still, you know, putting something out there that'll play in theaters, you know? Right. 
but yeah, I mean, gosh, just just about everything. Because because American Gangster, there's an, there's like a, a longer cut. Well, yeah, I mean, I don't know about his recent stuff, like like you know, La- Last Duel and stuff. But yeah, oh, Last Duel, I haven't watched that. I I have not either. Yeah, that was kind of a COVID movie. I feel <laughs> yeah, kind right? of right. Yeah, kind of. It came out, but it got kind of lost in the shuffle a little bit. That one and House of Gucci were like the same same time. Yeah, yeah. Wow, I forget. I've, I've seen House of Gucci, and I forgot that was a Ridley Scott movie. <laughs> I, I mean, that's what I'm saying, dude. He's he like since 2000, bro has been cranking these movies out, and they don't always resemble one another. It's kind of amazing. Yeah, I mean, uh, all the money in the world, right? That was him. That's right. I do remember that. And that movie, that's actually a really good example of what I'm talking about in terms of his his utter command of his frame, where obviously all that shit came out about Kevin Spacey, and he's like, well, screw that guy, I don't want him in my movie, so let's put in Christopher Plummer. And and he doesn't reshoot anything, he just stands him up in front of a blue screen and he knows exactly what to shoot to be able to just slot him right in. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And dude gets a, an Oscar nomination out of it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. You know, so that like to me, that's just very remarkable. You know. Mm-hmm. Oh, I'm seeing uh, one of my facts that I sort of messed up earlier. So Commodus was there was an attempted poisoning, but he vomited out the poison. That's okay. when he needed to be strangled. <laughs> okay, okay. So the stabbing that was somebody else. Yeah, they, I was messing up the stabbing, but yes, he was poisoned. Didn't work. So he was strangled. Okay. Well, that's what you got to do, I guess. Yeah. That's what you got to do. Succeed. Yeah. yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Try, try again. See, this is what, what I was kind of talking about earlier, right? Like the, the, the context of the conversation between, between Maximus and, and Senator Gracchus there, it's like, oh, we have to save Rome, Rome, you know, Rome has to be saved, whatever. And we have the benefit of, of hindsight to be like, well, Rome was not saved. In fact, Mm -hmm. you know what I mean? So it's a story that is asking us to root for, root for something to happen that we know won't happen. Hmm. Yeah. And that's just kind of interesting. Like, I'm not saying that's a, that's a good or bad thing, but I mean, that's just, you know, we have the benefit of hindsight, but the people who were, this is my point. The people who were living in Rome at that time were probably like, Hey, we got to make Rome a Republic again, you know, like, mm-hmm. and things didn't work out that way. You know, it, uh, reminds me of Titanic. We know how that story ends, but mm-hmm. every time you watch it, you're still rooting for them to get to the back of the boat as it's lifting up yeah. out of the air because that's what what you want to happen. You know, you're still rooting right. until the moment when all hope is lost. You are still rooting for perseverance, right? Well, and and honestly, I think both Titanic and this film work for the same reason. Where the historical milieu and, and everything is, is important, but it's texture to the human story. Right. So, mm-hmm. mm. so with, with Titanic, it's, we are watching knowing that Rose is an old lady and we don't know what happens to Jack. So it's sort of watching to find out what happens to Jack. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, we remember when she's introduced in the movie, she's Rose Dawson. Right. So we're kind of like, Oh, I guess Rose marries Jack. Right. And it's kind of, it's filling in with this, it, the story, it's not about, you know, it doesn't culminate in a big, you know, action sequence or something. We don't get that slave revolt. Yep. That ends up yep. not happening at all because ultimately it's, it's the, the battle of wills between these two men. Mm-hmm. Right. So we want to see that reach a, a, a conclusion that, that feels uh, earned. Right. Yeah. That's a good point. It is a good point. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always a huge fan of this sort of old school thing where they put the little f- flash of light over people's eyes. Over people's eyes? I was just about to say that. <laughs> yeah, I just, it, it's always so striking and cinematic. I love it. 
Well, it really shows the 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 craft of of the cinematographer. You know, like mm-hmm. we take for granted what they do. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And there's these subtle touches that have they have they have an impact on us emotionally that we don't even think about. Yeah. I remember. I think this year one of the most effective ones I saw was in that movie Saturday Night about uh, oh sure you know the first episode of SNL and it's when uh the show has just begun and it's live and one actor has not uh is not walking through the door on their cue mm-hmm. and Lorne Michaels like runs up into frame and is staring ahead like his whole life flashing before his eyes because everything could fall apart if this live experiment doesn't work and they just put this <laughs> slash of light across his eyes as he's freaking yeah. out I was like whoa that is good that it, I remember that that sequence, yeah. So effective. So this is creepy. Very creepy. And she's got to let it roll. She's got to keep him yeah. uh, thinking everything's A-OK. Very gross. Connie Nielsen is really good in this movie, though. You know, it's, it's obviously, you know, Joaquin and, you know, Russell Crowe get most of the conversation but i mean she's got a hard hard job you know Mm -hmm. but she she does it well i i I wish she you know like i feel like uh you know she had a brief run in the beginning of the 2000s and then she's wonder woman's mom Mm -hmm. and it's like well there's you know she should be i wish she'd do more stuff you know she was in nobody she was the wife and nobody oh that's right yeah yeah you know this whole thing this is also, I mean, I don't know who comes up with this stuff. It's the writer, Ridley Scott, whatever. But like, you can imagine a version of this where, you know, Commodus has her on the bed here and he like maybe forces a kiss or something and she doesn't reciprocate her. There's all these different right. versions of what you can do in this moment. But to have him say like, open your mouth. Yeah. And he like touches the inside of her mouth and then puts his finger in his mouth. It's just 20 times more disturbing than anything else. You know what I mean? It's so, so unnerving. Yeah. Weird and yeah, unnerving. <laughs> Without it being, you know, sort of more the blunt version of it. It's it's uh, it's good. Yeah. Makes you hate him even more. It is amazing to me because because uh, you know, the, there is a uh, a uh, a lot of restraint in this movie and that's what makes it effective and this is the same year that ridley scott made hannibal which is just one of the most egregious and awful movies i've seen really i've never seen it i've only seen silence uh, yeah, of the I, lambs i i saw it one time i saw it uh, when it came out and mm-hmm. and i i watch silence of the lambs all the time i think it's it's one of the greatest movies ever made mm-hmm. and you'd think oh a silence of the lambs sequel by by ridley scott right mm-hmm. like it yeah and and it was it's it's calamitous in terms of how utterly it it misreads what what made Silence of the Lamb so effective, you know. Hmm. And so it's amazing to you have the, the same guy make uh, uh, both of these movies in the same year, you know. Yeah. Hmm. It's it's not quite Eddie Murphy in in Dreamgirls and Norbit, but <laughs> <laughs> that's right. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, so right here, this would have been the scene where they they do a little rumpy pumpy. Yeah, yeah, you can see. I was even wondering if they were gonna kiss. Yeah, I think the kiss is fine, but it it it, it walks right up to it. You know, you you want to know that uh, his wife is still number one in this moment. Yeah, like I, I remember Crow himself talking about that in an interview where he 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 said that he he kiboshed it. Yeah. He said something to the effect of like they they kiss and then Bob's your uncle, they they you know they do the nasty and that was the first time I saw Bob's your uncle as a as like oh they, a, oh that's literally what he said yeah yeah I thought that was you <laughs> no 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 that was that, and I I was like that I had to look that up because I never heard that before <laughs> that's funny yeah. right for those who, Bob's your uncle means like and then there you have it kind of, yeah exactly yeah it's <laughs> <laughs> really funny. It is such a weird, like, I love that phrase because it's so clearly rooted in s- specific cultural details and everything. Mm-hmm. And there, there they are kissing. Bob's your yep. uncle. <laughs> <laughs> I 
Now, who was her husband? Uh, well, we don't. It's just some guy, right? Lucius. Okay, yeah. he has the same name as the son, so it's Lucius. Yeah, but we we don't know anything about him, or he had no relationship with Maximus or anything. N- right. Yeah. That is like a task I would not want being some sort of palace guard and having to like play fight, you know, with like the Royal boy. Right. Like, <laughs> like oh my God, you know, I accidentally <laughs> hurt him or he's going to hurt me and everything's going to be all right. Like no one's going to care. There's no way the story ends well. Yeah. No, there's no good version of that for you. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, it, you, you mentioned uh, inventing the abbot. Like I said, that was the first time I saw uh, uh, Joaquin Phoenix, like in a way that I knew him. Have you seen that movie? I haven't. I would like to revisit. I remember really liking it when I saw it. Yeah, I don't I was even... like a dumb kid in high school. So <laughs> I, I, I don't like I remember the title, I guess, maybe from like the video store or something, but I don't really know it. It has Billy Crudup and Jennifer Connelly and Liv Tyler. Like, it's all these people, you know? Hmm. Yeah, let's check it out. Um, one of my friends, he loves to die for. So I've yeah, seen that a couple sure, times. Sure. He's really good in that. He's the guy that Nicole Kidman seduces, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. What's that? Uh, it's like sort of inspired by that story. I uh, I can't remember her name. Uh, May December recently was also inspired by the same real life story about the teacher Laterno. Is that right? Laterno was was to die for that though. Really? I think it was like at least inspired by it. It's not. It's not based on it. Sure, sure. But yeah, teacher seducing her student. I thought this was kind of interesting. Him telling uh, Lucius the these stories. It's like you you know your bedtime stories, but they're all about your relatives. Like mm-hmm. these are the stories that still live on, but they happen to be your family. Mm-hmm. You know. I love I love this though. Just like Lucilla, she's just like, what is she supposed to do? You know, uh-huh. and she knows exactly what he's doing. It's just a total power trip. You know, yeah. kid has no idea what's going on. Yeah. And apparently, I guess he did order her execution in real life. That's right. Yeah. After uh, a failed assassination plot against him. Yeah. she Within uh, two years of him becoming emperor. Because hmm. he ruled for, for 12 years after becoming emperor. So. Wow. Not quite the abbreviated tenure that, that this movie shows. Mm-hmm. And like I don't co-ruled know. at some point, right? With Marcus yeah, Aurelius? Uh, uh, Marcus Aurelius, uh, yeah, for like three years. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What were you going to say? I was just like, I, you know, I mean, everybody's like plotting against everybody else. There's no, you know, f- d- does family mean nothing? Did we learn nothing from Dom Toretto? <laughs> <laughs> I was just thinking that actually, where it's like all this vying for power and the throne and it's... It, I don't know. It's like everyone in the family is a target in a weird sort of way, right? Right. Like it's, it just know, it seems I do it. it seems really stressful to me. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Oh, that's people. funny. This reminds me of uh, Attack of the Clones. Now that I think about it. Oh, there you. We needed little... a lightsaber to to flick that snake right off the dude. Yeah, off the bed. Yeah. Ugh, what an awful way to die. So that's that's probably what what uh, Lucas was trying to evoke. Yeah, probably. And well, there's the whole arena battle too. Uh, Maybe he just watched Gladiator. And he's like, hold on. <laughs> like grabbed his. Uh, kind of makes sense that the the timeline works, you know. Yeah, he he grabbed his legal pad. <laughs> it's like I have an idea. <laughs> Snakes, arenas. See, so all this. Look at this. This is a stand-in. That's not Oliver Reed. Ah. Right. And then okay. this right here, they they pasted his head on from a different shot. And when he speaks, it's off camera. You know, now that I know. Yeah. I can, you can see, see it. it. You can see it, right? <laughs> right? <laughs> Isn't that amazing? 
That is amazing. You know what? Not bad. In the year 2000, come on. Yeah. That's pretty good. I think so. You know, I mean, whenever filmmakers have to work around something like this, it's not easy, right? I mean, Mm -hmm. Carrie Fisher with Rise of Skywalker, Mm -hmm. it's, it's a shitty problem to have to deal with, you know? What does she say? Something about always trust a droid or something. Yeah. Yeah. It just kind of makes you think like you always, maybe like it's some sort of safety measure. Always have your actors say some sort of phrase that's very, very vague, <laughs> <laughs> you know, so they can use it as like a random callback later in the film. <laughs> God forbid, you know, in some sort of scenario like this where you lose your actor, but like, <laughs> Yeah. I mean, what, what does he say? Shadows and dust or. Yeah, exactly. It's you know? perfect. <laughs> you just, Hey, listen, just for safety. Can you kind of look glance upward to the right and say, well, we may never know. And it's like, well, why am I saying that? Just, just, just... <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> or like, and on and on it goes. <laughs> like, something like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You're like, what, yeah, why? Mean, uh, why are you having me do this? Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's like this grim thing that the people know just comes with working on a Zaki Hassan production. That's right. <laughs> He's going to have you do it. He's going to have you do that line. <laughs> See, look at this right here. The, the shot of, of Proxima, as he says his last line, it's the same shot from earlier in the, in the arena or like before entering. Watch right here. That's probably a double. Yeah, that's a that's a that's a, right there. That's you know literally what? it's a it works. It, it totally does. You're it not works. thinking about it. You're nope. not thinking about it at all. No, nope. because that's the thing, right? It's like well, Proximo either he lives to the end or he has a big death, but he can't just disappear because mm-hmm, mm-hmm. he's too important, you know. Yep. See, and there goes Rolf Muller, and we feel bad. Yep, we've gotten to know him. He pretended to be poisoned that one time. And <laughs> yeah. A good time was had by all. Yeah, we all laughed. <laughs> you were there. You were there. <laughs> that, that The horse there and that sort of misty lighting reminded me of Legend. Oh, wow. That's Ridley Scott, right? Ridley Scott, yeah. Yeah. Ugh. Oh, this, this hurt. See, I didn't was... remember this movie beat for beat, and I had forgotten about this. Um, and man, it's the oh, arrows that does yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, he's like, maybe he can help him, but... Yeah, oh no, he's definitely dead. See, that's the whole thing. I mean, they set up the whole prospect of of like a, a big final battle with the mm-hmm. slave revolt, and it's a total it's a total rug pull. Yeah, it's devastating. Right? This stuff looks really good, this sort of early CGI. I mean, well, that looks a little dodgy, but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this looks like the opening of The Mummy. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, yeah, I mean, a lot of the buildings and the whatever, that sort of establishing shot looked pretty good. Yeah. Oh, Commodus. (laughs) So disappointing. It is just kind of this weird, I mean, I'm never on his side, but his whole wanting the people to love him and you know, every decision he makes pushes yeah. them further and further away. Yeah. Again, I, th- I think this gets to sort of, I agree with you. Like I, he's, he's just awful, but like, you know, in a weird sense, the, 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 the basis for how he ended up this way, I think the movie does a good job of filling it in. Like he's, you know, it's like, well, he, he had an absent father who was shitty to him and this is how he ended up, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so, oh, why don't they love me? It's that same. He says to his father, why don't, why don't you love me? Right. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's something anybody can relate to. Yeah. Not to the, you know, patricide, <laughs> patricidal extent of things, but you know, that's a very human f- feeling, you know? No, it's enough to make him a human being, but yes. then you have him do enough things that are horrible that he cannot take back where then you're like, okay, well, no. He is a yeah. villain. We can understand why he's a villain, and that's terrible. But he's done too many bad things for us to ever be on his side. Exactly. So, yeah. so really, you're just you're rooting for uh, for for Maximus to just kick the living shit out of him. Hmm. Yeah. See this too uh, when he when he says, "Am I not merciful?" He just improvised that. 
I want to see it now. It's so good. I mean, that's not, you know, if he, if he just came up with that, that's pretty good. I mean, it's a it's great pretty moment. pretty good. You know? Yeah. I mean, knowing that they worked, well, or that the script was sort of in flux as they were working, it's a real uh, testament, not just to Ridley Scott, but to the actors yep. who are invested enough in their characters and in the story and, you know, yeah, exactly. everything that's going on that they can come up with this stuff and create these really memorable moments. I love this. I don't know what you'd call it. Costume that he's wearing right here. There's something I was really... going to bring that up. I was like, it's a very effective uh, 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 costume. Yeah. It's weird. Uh-huh. Like it being such light colors, you almost feel like that would be on a hero. Right. It's very ghostly. But, you know, he wants to portray himself as a hero. Yeah, but it still comes across as tainted or something. Like he looks, I don't know, there's something very haunting about it to me. Yeah, yeah. So this scene is originally scripted. They kiss here and then Bob's your uncle. They have sex. And, you know. <laughs> Russell, Russell Crowe was like, that doesn't make sense at all. You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Crow has talked about, you know, you know, there's one thing making the movie and you're in it and, you know, you don't know how the audience is going to react. And then he talked about watching this with an audience for the first time. And specifically this scene, you know, when, when Commodus stabs him and, and there were people in the audience screaming like you mf -er," you know? Yeah. Yeah. And at that moment, Russell Crowe was like, oh, okay. I think, I think we're onto something here. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's so great. I mean, we want this fight to happen. We've been waiting for this the whole movie, but then just to see even, you know, more despicable behavior from the villain, like not only will he. Are they going to square off all the things he's already done? And now he's going to disable our hero. You know, like yeah. it's just so, so much despicableness. It's so you're rooting even more mm-hmm. if that's even possible for, for Maximus. I remember watching this the first time. See, I think part of it is because Maximus is so clearly out, outmatching Commodus, right? It's not mm-hmm. it, 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 right. You're, you're like, well, he's going to just kick his ass all over the schoolyard, right? So in a story sense, you kind of have to handicap him. But the other, I remember watching this opening night and as soon as, you know, Commodus just shanks him, I'm like, oh, okay, Maximus is going to die. Mm. Like, I remember thinking that I was like, I was like, well, he'll probably defeat him, but he's going to die. I know, I know it's going to end with him dying. Interesting. And I was like, kind of bummed about that, you know? Yeah. So I'm just looking up even more. Commodus facts. <laughs> Sorry, these are just so fascinating. It says he was uh, reported to be cowardly, weak, easily influenced, and with a cruel streak, such as having a man thrown into an oven because of lukewarm bath water. Wow. He was, ass- he was assassinated by uh, uh, his masseuse or the trainer, like you said, at the yeah. instigation of his mistress of 11 years after she found her name on <laughs> Commodus's list Can you of believe people that? to be executed. <laughs> He left his to kill list lying around. Unbelievable. She saw her name and then she had him killed. She saw her name at the top of his to kill list. Wow. I mean, so that's almost like a trope you see in films, right? Where yes. someone discovers a letter uh-huh. or some sort of list and you're like, oh, come on. But it's like, well, there you go. It's history, folks. It, it is history. <laughs> wow. I just, I love that list. Oh, he was known as being cowardly and this. Yeah. Like, it's like, man, that's. It's like he had a small penis. <laughs> yeah, he, right, yeah. right. <laughs> but he'd say that it wasn't small, but everybody knew that it was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. Can you imagine? It's like these people, if they could read their Wikipedia page, he's like, what? Right. Like, that's what I was thinking. That's exactly the thought I was having. I was like, one day, the, like thousands of years from now, if you make it into the history books, that's one level of achievement, but there's still the matter of what the history books say about you. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. But yeah, so much more drama now, right? I mean, we yeah, just see it, right? Maximus like, at a disadvantage. If, 
It, that's exactly it, right? And we were talking about Robin Hood earlier. Uh, one thing I remember about that movie is it ends with this big freaking like charge, a charging army versus charging army. And I was like, bro, this is Robin Hood, man. Like, what are we, what are we doing? Right, that's right. I do remember you know? that. Yeah, and, and that's the the dilemma, right? Because this we're so much more invested in. Mm-hmm. Because big picture, we know what happens to Rome or whatever. That's all, but we don't know what happens to Maximus. Mm-hmm. Who is not a real character, right? That's correct. I mean, yeah, he's he may be inspired by someone. But inspired, but not. yeah, I think there, there was a, Marcus Aurelius had a general who short shared who was not a slave slash gladiator, but mm-hmm. uh, similar characteristics and yeah, various other people. <laughs> oh, Quintus! Quintus, you son of a bitch! <laughs> <laughs> Not quite the return to form we were hoping for, to your point earlier, but it's enough in this moment. That's <laughs> right. He's not fully redeemed, is what I'm saying. But <laughs> it's, a, it's a quasi redemption. Yeah, I I love this whole thing Me where it's too. like Maximus is like bouncing between the the realms, you know. Yep, one foot in the afterlife, one foot in in uh, reality. Yeah, it's yeah. it's played very well. We can see it in his face here. It, his, I mean, dude, Russell Crowe is a freaking great actor. I mean, it, it's like a very obvious thing to say, but like, I think, I think his performance in this film is, is underrated. And I say that knowing he won an Oscar for it, but yeah, because I think some, not everybody was on board with that. Right. But I think, you know, on the face of it, this can look like a big blockbustery type movie, but I think there's a lot more going on here. And I certainly think with him. Yeah. There's a lot of things he's doing that just make it so much richer. Yeah. Ugh. Now I know I love Mercy, but I have to admit <laughs> that he was slowly shoving the knife into his throat. I was like, yes. Brian's bloodthirsty side is coming out. Yeah. Oh, it's there. It's there. <laughs> That'll do it. Yeah. He, he earned it. He had it coming. I mean, he had Maximus's family burned to a crisp. I think. Yeah, and I think he get he gets what's coming. And that's that's the last thing that happened to them. I mean, horrible things before that. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. This. I mean, look at the way he's playing it. Right? Like it's it's like he's 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 like I'm ready to go. You know, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. but there's just one more thing I have to do, you know? Yeah. All this, not just talk of the afterlife, but actually showing it. Mm-hmm. To, oh, I love that. Reaching out for the door. And that's great. Seeing him do yeah. it in reality, but then getting to see him do it in the afterlife. I mean, that's, yeah, I think that's really crucial for our satisfaction at the end of this story. I think it's executed really well. Yeah. I mean, if, <laughs> if we don't see that stuff and he just keels over. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't work quite as well. Yeah. It'd be funny, he's like, Quintus, free my men. And Quintus like, your men will join you in the afterlife. And he's like, God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then he keels over. <laughs> God <Yeah>. damn. <laughs> <laughs> I can admit me at the test screening. <laughs> All the cards. <laughs> People furiously writing. <laughs> Loved it. Until. <laughs> I do love this uh, wide shot that they do where he's being carried away, but Commodus's body remains. Yeah. On the floor. Because yeah, F that guy. Yeah. It's like we're watching on mute, but I can hear this music. You know? I know. Yeah, I'm sort of getting like wrapped up in it. <laughs> yeah, at at the Zimmer concert, you know, he had Lisa Gerard there. Um, oh, really? You know, singing this portion? Yeah, yeah. Oh my God, what a! Oh wow! I mean, it, it, talk about a transporting voice. Yeah. I believe she also is on the score for for Insider. Oh, interesting. Yeah. 
Which you said you have not seen The Insider? No, I have. Okay. But not recently. No, it's been a while. Yeah. I remember loving it. I want to watch oh that. Oh my again. gosh. Dude, I watch that. I screen it, you know, in my classes, mm. right? So I watch it all the time. I I it's one of my all time favorite movies. You know it'd be terrible. So we got him in this wheat field and he's walking toward his wife and son. But uh, Commodus has just died too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It's not like all of a sudden Commodus like walks in and like, hi. <laughs> He's like, oh my, no, no, no. <laughs> I, was just, I was literally just thinking that. <laughs> <laughs> He's got the house next door in heaven. <laughs> well, you know, they, they were planning a sequel. Like, I mean, Ridley Scott, like as soon as this joint took off, he was like, man, I got to do a sequel. It took mm-hmm. him a minute to get there. But they were planning a sequel, which was like, maximus in the afterlife and and this is true and it, like he becomes like uh, it, he he comes back to earth and he has to fight christianity like it was real bananas i'm not making this up yeah no nick cave wrote it yes yes exactly yeah um yeah he's in modern times at some point right yes exactly yeah like in a suit in an office which okay so obviously that sounds insane and ridiculous but dot 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 don't you kind of wish they made that movie you know i i don't know what it's about i haven't read it but i love the ambition of that (laughs) i can picture a version of that being kind of cool but probably you know (laughs) with a lot of asterisks yeah 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 the the uh, (laughs) likelihood of that actually working i don't know So the, see again. So the the runner here with with the the figurines and the family so perfect. So originally this would have been Proximo. Yeah, it. I read that. Yeah, yeah. Which, but I think it, it's so it. much better with it being Juba. Yeah, I agree. You know. Um. Yeah, that's nice. So now we are free until they get recaptured and enslaved again. I'm assuming. In Gladiator 2. Yeah, right? Because it's not like the Gladiator game stops. So. Yeah, that's a good point. You know what's funny? I hadn't even considered what the story would be for 2. I'm just like, okay, it's just going to be more of that. Like, And I'm into it, you know? Ridley Scott, I'm glad he's back. I'm, I'm curious. I, I'm hopeful. But uh, I hadn't really given much thought. Maybe because, you know, like I said, I haven't watched this movie a ton. So I remembered See, moments know, from it, but not exactly You know what would make this ending better right here, Brian? Uh, if you play All Star, <laughs> somebody once yeah, right told me. <laughs> directed by Ridley Scott. <laughs> the years stop coming and they don't stop coming. <laughs> it was like yeah, it's the early two thousands. It's DreamWorks. <laughs> they gotta have Smash Mouth on retainer, you know. <laughs> Okay, sorry, I didn't. I interrupted you. I apologize. No, 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 no it was worth it. Uh, I don't even know, but that's great. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> yeah, that's so much better than the. I mean, Lincoln Park sort of uh, took over that <laughs> mantle in like the mid to late two thousands. That's right. Yeah. So, so thoughts on Gladiator? Twenty four years later, you know, I I loved it, and I've got to say. I, I kind of am glad that I haven't seen it over and over again because I got to mm. almost experience it in a fresh sort of way last night and before seeing the new one and be reminded what an incredible movie it is. Yeah. I mean, it's really, really good. I think I don't know really what uh, everybody's opinion is on it. I know it's mostly beloved, but I, my memory was it being kind of a, a good blockbuster. Right. And I was reminded that it's so much more. Right. Like a yeah. really, really great character piece. So much great lines, incredible, not just photography, but just direction. The, in, yeah. you know, the intentionality of all the direction. I mean, that's just, it's a really wonderful film. It is. And, and, you know, I remember saying when it came out, man, they don't make them like this anymore. Yeah. It definitely feels like that now, 24 years after it came out. They really You're reminding like me. This. I think I literally said that last night. They don't make them like yeah. this anymore. And they don't. They literally <laughs> they don't. Just don't. Yeah. Uh, and, and yeah, I mean, neither of us has seen the second one. So this is very much a time capsule. Mm-hmm. But uh, uh, whether that one rises or falls has nothing, uh, no impact whatsoever on uh, how effectively this one rises. Mm-hmm. You know? 
But good pick. I'm glad we did this. And I'm glad that I'm prepped now because I'm seeing the new one in two days. So, Yeah, same. So yeah. Uh, we will be back soon on our show to talk through uh, Gladiator 2. But in the meantime, hey, let us know your thoughts on, on the original Gladiator. You can email us at moviefilmpodcast at gmail.com. You can also hit like on our Facebook page, facebook.com slash moviefilmpodcast and message us there. We also have a Patreon, Brian. Yes, we do. At patreon.com slash moviefilmpodcast, you'll find all of our previous commentaries without any advertisements and you will find every regular episode and commentary to come all absolutely ad free for five dollars a month so five dollars a month that's it i know actually you know we we set that because we were like what's like about the price of a cup of coffee right and i was just reading some article about starbucks and how they're struggling at the moment and people were complaining that certain drinks there cost eight dollars and i was like well eight dollars $5 $5 is a steal now. I agree. So, yeah, so for $5 a month, you can find uh, every commentary, every episode absolutely ad-free at patreon.com slash moviefilmpodcast. For less than a cup of coffee at Starbucks. Incredible. Incredible. Okay, I I think it, it's, it's uh, you know... I'm, I'm pretty, I'm pretty uh, proud of, of the service we are offering the world, Brian. <laughs> yeah, me too. Yeah. You gotta take pride uh, in your work. Uh, with that in mind, please, please go to our Patreon. <laughs> well, actually, and thank you, thank you to everyone who has signed up. It's been please and thank you. Yes, it's been really, really uh, encouraging and gratifying. So, thank you for everyone who has signed up and is listening to this currently ad free. Hello, <laughs> you're, you're all all stars, as far as I'm concerned. Exactly. Uh, so with that, on behalf of my partner, Brian Hall, my name is Aki Hassan. This has been our movie film commentary for Gladiator. We'll catch you next time. Thank you, folks.